Why don't we start off with that, with you seeking? Yeah. Did you catch all that? <laughs> well, what do I need to do? Well, Peggy's going to want to participate in the um, discussion. Problem is that do that. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, all right. We'll try to. We'll stumble along. We'll see how it uh, how we do. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Regular. Yeah. Number six. Okay. <coughs> I'd like to call to order the. Second, folks, folks, I'd like to call to order the second uh, special city council meeting of this evening. This is the city council study session regarding the annual sugar sweetened beverage tax. Uh, may we have a staff report, please? Yes, thank you, Mayor. Uh, this study session follows the ordinance that was adopted by the voters in November, 26, November 2016, approving the sugar sweetened beverage tax. As you'll recall, as part of that ordinance, it calls for a study session each year by the council to receive recommendations regarding the expenditure of proceeds from that tax. Your first study session was held in November 2017, and Per the ordinance, recommendations were sought from our Social and Economic Justice Commission, Park Recreation and Open Space Commission, Transportation Commission, the school district, and individuals with specialized expertise in public health issues. <clears throat> Following that study session, staff developed an expenditure plan, and that was incorporated into the budget as approved by council in June of 2018. And I'd like to give you just a quick overview of uh, what the council had given direction to staff to develop and budget uh, so that you know what we've achieved to date for this first year of the funding tax. Um, we have installed five of the seven water bottle filling stations. Two are left to install uh, within the month. We've also funded the school crossing guard program, which is a contractual agreement for services. And we've also just recently launched the classes in parks and the nutrition cooking classes. You'll see those come out in our next edition of the recreation guide, as well as the educational campaign that goes along with those programs. Um, there is a full spread in the recreation guide, and we're also building out our web page regarding this topic. And one thing that I really appreciate that the council did in developing this expenditure plan is the priorities that you see in the left column because it helps inform staff of where to put our resources first. And as you can see, we've, we've done a number of the things. One thing that we haven't implemented and we have some challenge in implementing, no pun intended, <laughs> is the community fitness challenge uh, just due to staff capacity. Uh, one potential recommendation here would be to utilize that funding for the classes in the parks and the nutrition cooking classes as those seem to be very well received thus far with a lot of signups. Uh, in terms of your study session tonight, you have a number of items in your staff report. So I'd like to just touch on a couple of those as they may help inform your discussion as you receive recommendations. Um, the first is attachment Two, which I've just went over, which gives you a nice background on the Measure 01, the sugar sweetened beverage tax, and the work that you've done to date. 
The second is attachment eight, which is a chart that summarizes what we've received to date in terms of recommendations for the use of the sugar sweetened beverage tax funds. Uh, and also identifies when there's overlapping interest between a group. So you see the, the names of the groups there at the top, the Park Recreation Open Space Commission, SEJC, Transportation Commission, the community staff, and some tentative costs along with comments. Uh, if there was any additional background information we could provide. Pardon me, Nicole. I, I'm, I'm a little bit um, stymied because I forgot my charging cord for my laptop, which has oh. all my stuff on it. Which attachment are you looking at right now? Attachment eight. It's in here. Okay, eight. Yes. And it's not, it's not on. I'm going to yeah, put it, it up it, on the screen. It's under okay. letters. In the, oh, they're under letters. Well, that's. Yeah, I, th I think we're talking uh, Let's see. attachment E. On the I legislate. Uh, e is. S -E I'm sorry, it's right? I. Attachment I. <coughs> okay. Or I. Thank okay. you, Councilmember Pilch. Okay. Thank you. Uh, again, we can we can delve into this later after you've received the comments from the folks here tonight. I just wanted to flag it for your attention. Um, and something else that we placed on the dais and also in the back of the room uh, this evening is a overview of the revenue expenditures so you can see the big picture on that what's projected to be received what has been received and what is expended or intended to be expended based on your existing exp expenditure plan I should note that um, the two of the columns here are estimated and I caution that they are estimated because as you know with this tax it's uncertain exactly what the the proceeds will generate. So um, just just a note there, and I have it up on the screen as well. Uh, with that, I'd be happy to answer any questions you may have, and then we would um, look to the mayor to invite up the folks named in the ordinance uh, to provide their recommendations to the council, and then, of course, the public as well. Thank you. Are there questions from the council? Yeah, so... Um, You'll have to remind me, probably for the nth time, uh, fiscal year 2019 is 2018 to 2019 or 2019 to 2020? It is 2018 to 2019. Thank you. Now, now the other wrinkle with that is that this was adopted in November of 2016, and, and we received the funding after it was implemented through our admi tax administrator. Right, so, uh, and that leads to my second question. So thank you for this chart. Um, so this, this indicates that at the end, uh, well, I'll just use years because it's easier for me. Um, in 2020, in June 30th, 2020, we're estimated to have received total 526,000 something. But that's by June 30th, 2020, okay. And we have programmed only 289,000 and, and something so far. Right, as okay. you program them typically by fiscal year as we incorporate into the budget. Okay, and the fiscal year, we've incorporated for the fiscal year ending this June 30th. Yes. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Um, council member, or vice mayor, uh, McQuaid, do you have any questions? No. Okay. Uh, Council Member Moss. Um, just to get this straight in my mind, um, the, the the only monies that we've actually spent up to this point is on either the crossing guard program or um, uh, the um, um, the water fountain, uh, water re refilling stations, and the the classes are all. Uh, maybe we've spent we've spent the money for the catalogs, but they haven't actually. They're about to start. They haven't yes. really gotten going yet. So none of the classes, uh, the nutrition classes, the uh, educational campaign, uh, that's all about to come up. But it hasn't actually gotten rolling yet. So uh, yeah, those are definitely programmed in. The classes are advertised, and they are. Um, ready and available for sign up now and we've re received a number of sign ups so those funds are basically encumbered for those programs okay uh, 
in terms of if they've actually been expended and sent to the, the uh, contract service provider. No, they haven't yet, but the funds that have indeed been expended are the purchase of the water bottle filling stations as well as the installation costs associated with that and certainly the crossing guard uh, contract. Okay. Mm -hmm. All right. Thank you. Is that all? That's it. Okay. Council Member Barnes, any questions? No, I just want to say that the rule is fiscal years take the date of the calendar year in which they end. That's the way I always remember it. Yeah. Okay, well, um, as uh, City Manager Almaker uh, mentioned, the prime, according to our uh, ordinance, the um, primary purpose of, the, uh, uh, of this study session is to solicit recommendations from the City's Parks and Recreation Commission, Social and Economic Justice Commission, Traffic and Safety Commission, a designated representative of the Albany Unified School District, and from persons with specialized expertise in areas such as public health issues and programs relating to diabetes, obesity, and sugary drink consumption, and any other individuals or organizations who would like to give uh, input. So I think we start with the Parks, Recreation, and Open Space Commission. Do we have a representative here? Thank you. I'm joined by Eva from the staff who's going to be here to answer additional questions. Um, thank you so much for the opportunity to speak to you all. We have uh, a series of uh, recommendations, and I think you all have that in your packet. I'm just going to walk you through what they are and then would be happy to take any questions. I'm so, sorry. Could you start by identifying sorry. yourself? Sorry. I'm Harriet Patterson. I'm the chair of the Parks, Recreation, and Open Space Commission. So I'm here to reflect the uh, suggestions from my fellow commissioners and I as a part of the reflection process that we did on this. The three kind of main areas that we looked at were equipment, um, fitness, nutrition, and cooking, and then also community recreation, because we sort of started with the mandate written in the law, which is to look at how it can address health of young people, at-risk populations, and sort of our community overall. On the equipment side, we were very interested in water uh, bottle filling stations, but had some additional suggestions of areas that we felt might be uh, might benefit from additional water resource. So we had Solano Avenue, uh, the Key Route Median at Brighton, where many of the middle and high school students pass by on their way to or from school, at the Albany Waterfront Park or the Bulb. Um, additional stations potentially along the Greenway, maybe by the exercise court and at Dartmouth Circle, and then also we suggested at school sites. So those are some just additional areas. We felt like the water uh, filling stations make a lot of sense in light of what this a particular initiative is focused on doing, which is to change people's behavior around sugary drinks. Um, we also had a suggestion to install an artistic or selfie-worthy water fountain, and I did. I think we did supply a picture. If you don't know what that is, I didn't know what it was at, at the beginning, but something kind of fun and different that would maybe be an attraction for people towards the water filling station. There was another suggestion about potentially um, a water station that has bubbly water, and perhaps that could be located at a place where people congregate for events or something like that, again, to just highlight a healthy nutrition, a nutritious alternative to sugary beverages. Um, we also had a suggestion to bring back a bike sharing program to Albany, and this is under equipment because the dockless one has gone away, so it might uh, require looking at something like Ford Bike or another company like that that requires a hardware installation um, and a startup cost. And then also um, <clears throat> install installing a public restroom on the Ohlone Greenway. That's a particular um, not only helps people to use that from a fitness standpoint and to be out and about, but also I think serves the wider community in a bigger way and uh, meets a need that we all saw. On the fitness, nutrition, and cooking side, we're really excited about the things that are underway and about to get started and also wanted to make a suggestion that we consider making a deeper investment in those. Um, they're only starting now, but we feel that there is going to be a real interest in 
The offerings, if you haven't seen them, will include girls and women's ultimate frisbee pickup games at Ocean View Park, all-in-one uh, fitness train smart play hard live well program at the Ohlone Exercise Court, which has already been um, put out, um, adaptable family wheeled mobility at the Albany Middle School, Tai Chi and Memorial Park, and also caregiver boot camp with infant and toddler at the Ocean View Tennis Courts. And the idea would be to make a deeper investment of additional resource to help those um, courses expand and continue. And then similarly, we're having a lot of responsiveness to the um, free youth cooking classes that will be offered this summer. I think there are about nine of those. So looking to make a deeper investment there as well as to offer some adult cooking classes. We'll be offering um, a four-part series, What's in Season in Your Kitchen, as well as an Asian vegetarian cooking class for adults and to be able to make those available to anyone in the community to help support nutritious food choices. Um, we also have uh, partnered with the Al Albany After School Program on a snack program and would like to suggest continuing that work, which includes healthy snacks. There's a committee of youth that help determine what those are. They help prepare them. And we also have a bowl of fruit that people can grab and go as they're um, there as a part of the Friendship Club. And finally, offering low or no cost fitness classes for people to participate in the recreation programs that we offer here in Albany. So to make those more widely accessible in our community, again, with the focus on youth and helping young people develop healthy behaviors and lifestyles that will support them as they move forward. And then finally, we had a whole group of um, suggestions in the community recreation area. One is around very popular events that um, Albany Try and the Marin Monster to provide t-shirts to have a healthy message on the back um, that would help those events, um, which are supporting, again, healthy behaviors and lifestyles, to conduct, uh, conduct a, or construct a toddler garden, which is a sensory-oriented garden um, that would allow toddlers to sort of smell and touch and um, also learn about healthy uh, growth of fruits and vegetables, to um, potentially use some funds to move the community garden at Ocean View, which is that community garden is under a lot of shade and it makes it very difficult to grow some of the things that people would like to grow. So that's already on our, our work plan to look at an additional or um, an alternative place so the, the funds could help support that move. Um, offering free learn to swim or learn to bike classes for youth so that we have accessible opportunities no matter what people's situations are at home or whether their parents know how to swim or bike, that we would have opportunity for everybody to be able to learn those skills if they want to. And um, organizing some kind of fun shark tank kind of competition for youth to come up with ideas for the sugar sweetened beverage proceeds. Um, and so that maybe in a middle school or a high school setting or perhaps in a late elementary school that kids would have an opportunity to get their ideas together to come forward in front of a panel of people and present them and maybe the best idea or two would get awarded some funds to help uh, institute something again involving youth in this um, healthy opportunity. And finally, um, we would like to suggest installing a fitness for all kind of uh, service center exercise stations at Peggy Thompson Pier Street Park to help augment the offerings that are available and again make fitness available to everyone. So those are our suggestions from the Parks Recreation and Open Space Commission and we're happy to take questions now or later as would be appropriate. Thank you Chair Patterson for the very thoughtful uh, uh, ideas and the uh, excellent presentation. Um, now we don't ordinarily have dialogue uh, during council meetings, we take presentations, but um, I think this being a study session, we have the flexibility to do that. So does anyone have any uh, questions for Chair Patterson? No? Okay. Um, just a quick one. I noticed you, you you kind of attach prices to some of these things, and then the, the equipment things, you know, there were there was no cost estimate on those. Uh, was there any discussion about it, or it just it would have taken a much longer discussion to figure out what what those prices are? I, I presume. Yeah, it was a, to do with what prices Shelley had sort of e easy access to, and I know that we have a sense of what the water bottle, bottle filling stations cost because we've just done that with some other ones, but I think her sense was as the priorities come out, we can then do deeper work on finalizing the cost. So we just had whatever cost estimates we already knew because it was either in a continuation or that information was readily available. Right. Okay. And also, as the council identifies priorities and gives direction to staff in terms of where you'd like to see the uh, proceeds, uh, the expenditure plan, we'll build that out for you and analyze those costs and provide them back to you in, at a May meeting. Okay. Well, thank you. I, I really liked a lot of your ideas. I think you guys really did a great job in putting that together. Thank you. Uh, Councilmember Barnes. 
Yeah, I want to talk about the bath, the restroom, because I think some of our advocates for people who are experiencing homelessness have thought that would be a help. And, you know, I've been to many outdoor sporting events where they just line up porta potties, and I see them even in more or less permanently established. It's some, you know, high school ball fields in the summer, for example, places like that. And I know they're sort of tacky, but believe me, if you're on a 60 mile bike ride, you learned where they all are and they'd really come in handy. So if we don't have budget for like a fancy, one of these French self-cleaning things like they tried in San Francisco, have we ever considered just doing conventional porta potties? Did you guys think that about it? That did not come up in our uh, session, but I will say that it was a person that has routinely picked up human excrement as a part of the Blue Glove group that yeah. was suggesting this is you know a real need in our community and i think we all agreed even from a recreation side it's a need but i think on the flip side we do have gap there um we did talk a little bit about where there were 24-hour restrooms in albany but um it just seemed like there was a gap and that is a space that could serve a wide range of needs i think that's a excellent idea to think more about how other types of restroom facilities might fill that mm -hmm. gap if if the cost is yeah. yeah, I know they're rebuilding the house next door to me, and there's been one of those porta potties out front for six months. So it's it's not like the neighborhood's in an uproar. I'm you know I'm just curious. It's if it was cheap enough, it might really be an option. Thank you, uh, Vice Mayor McQuaid. I did have a question about the free swimming lessons. Has there been discussion with the school district? We did not get that far, so that would have to be something that would be um, talked about with them and explored as a part of whether it was a part of the curriculum or just because the aquatic center. Thank you. Council member Pilch, do you have any questions? Okay. Well, actually, can so I, much. Mayor, may I just, when you came up with your whole list, which I think is pretty comprehensive and, and I like most of it, did you have any overriding philosophy or goals that you were sort of helped you guide your your choices because you had many many things you could have chosen from i think there was a general consensus that we wanted to focus first on things that directly replaced sugar sweetened beverages which is why the water came up immediately and most um most immediately with the group and also on things that are looking at young people and how they learn about healthy healthy behaviors around food and exercise and then the second piece of it was really about accessibility and affordability and trying to make those opportunities available to all people. So anything that was offering low cost, that was offering based on reduced free lunch services or things like that, I think were especially appealing to our group because we felt like that's part of our charge is to make sure that is available to everyone. Similar with the swim lessons or the biking or things like that, that not every family will be able to do on their own. But if the city offers that as a part of this program, it may help to establish healthy patterns for people. Mm -hmm. This sounds like a crazy idea, but you know, we have this money for public art. If we just had public sculptures that also produce bubbly, fizzy water, we could kind of do a two for one. <laughs> I love that, thanks. <laughs> Thank you so much. Do we have a representative of the Social and Economic Justice Committee present? Um, I'm Judy Kerr, and I'm a commissioner with the Social and Economic Justice Commission. Um, and just to kind of give you a broad overview, um, we used a slightly different approach um, in our, our assessment of our, our items for recommendation. We started with seven different items and boiled it down to three because we really wanted to give uh, the council our best shot and our highest priorities to what we wanted to talk about. And our primary focus really is on underserved and unserved individuals in the community based on the notion of inclusion. Um, so we, we very much recognize that any program can be inclusive, um, but these are targeted specifically for that. So um, walking you through the first one is to consider using beverage tax revenues to bring mobile medical clinics to underserved, unhoused individuals. So this is a recommendation that's come to us through our meetings at Social and Economic Justice Commission, it would require um, contracting with an RFP, and we targeted about $40,000 a year to provide this service. I think in the packet that uh, the city, that Nicole provided you, there's mention of the fact that some of these services are already provided, 
However, the locations that I could determine really don't come close to Albany or even to, to West Berkeley. So where our hope would be to improve the coverage geographically of the um, mobile medical clinics. So that's item number one. Um, the second item is to consider using beverage tax revenues to bring mobile dental clinics to Albany one to two times a year to provide dental health screenings to economically disadvantaged youth, children, basically. Um, dental insurance, as we all know, is, is limited, and there are certainly children who don't get routine dental screenings, um, and it seemed an appropriate and uh, inclusive use of so sweet, sweet and beverage revenues to, to target this. This also would require, <coughs> excuse me, an RFP, and we would need to locate a contract with a dental, a pediatric dental provider who would do the screenings. So it would just be a question of screening. It would not be ongoing repair or any, anything else but simple screening. And finally, our third recommendation, and these are not prioritized, by the way. They're just numbered for clarity, so they're not, there's no priority in these. Um, consider using beverage tax revenues to establish monthly wellness clinics at the senior center. Um, and the goal would be um, to uh, bring a mid-level provider and additional fund case management services to the at-risk Albany seniors. Um, so, and also to include potential podiatry services. And there, are, there have previously been podiatry services at the senior center, um, and I guess that may or may not be able to return, but, but it is something that we think, um, given our, you know, the graying population and the tsunami of seniors that we're looking at here in Albany, um, I think it's important that we not only provide services through this, this revenue source to youth, but also to seniors. Um, so again, the, the way that this would be provided would be through contract. Um, it would, um, this particular item, would give us a starting point um, to really working toward having Albany an, an aging friendly city um, and to really meet the, the federal recommendations from the AARP and other programs. And it would put us in a place where we could begin to build those programs. So. So, any questions? Thank you. Any questions from the council for Commissioner Kerr? <laughs> okay, seeing none. Thank um, you. Oh well. well I, I, I <laughs> council member Michael, Moss. But, but I'll jump in. Uh, um, I, I, these are all great ideas, also. Um, and you have kind of uh, amounts attached to each one of them. Um, was that? Um, based on some idea of what these particular services might cost, or did you just, you It was know? a very rough estimate based on my experience in, in healthcare administration. So ah. it's my personal experience knowing how much providers cost, knowing how much time a clinic runs, and then projecting numbers from there. So it's okay. a very rough estimate. And, it, and if, given that it would be an RFP, it could be given that, you know, that nobody would bid on it at that rate, and, and they right. wouldn't have it, or you'd have five people who did, and you'd be okay. And and also they, they you know there there's there'd be something left over if these numbers were correct uh, given how much we we will get in a in a one of the year. other items that was on our original seven was the continuation of the crossing guard program so we did support that although it didn't reflect in your document because we didn't have the full seven in the final document so we do support that um, however we recognize that it has a potential to to drink up a lot of sweetened beverage. The, the crossing guard can be very costly. Um, and so the revenue could very much creep um, beyond the ability of even that tax to provide it. So we, although we didn't put it into this, this packet, there was talk about you know, coming up with a percentage of how much the revenue would give back to the crossing guard program. So. Okay, thank you. I have a question. Um, any other questions from other members of the council before I ask mine? Um, one of the things that we learned during the, um, uh, the hearings that led up to the adoption of the sugar sweetened beverage tax, is, and uh, which is reflected in our ordinance um, in the, uh, uh, that we adopted, 
is that African American and Latino children are aggressively targeted with advertisements to promote sugar-laden drinks. And I was curious if the Social and Economic Justice Commission had any, um, had learned anything, had any access to information about different demographic groups' consumption of sugar-sweetened beverages. Um, and I'm thinking about those groups, but also thinking about uh, uh, children from children of English learning parents, people coming from uh, from other countries. Do you do you see any? Do you know of any the uh, information? The commission did not actually review any data about that. Um, okay. I can tell you from personal experience that you can go to the American Academy of Pediatric Dentists, and you can find data on the incidence of pediatric caries in different ethnic groups, and you will find exactly the kind of information that you're talking about. But in our conversation, we did not include that. Yeah, and there's nothing Albany-specific that, uh, that you Only know Only as of. it would be reflected in national data. Yeah, okay. All right, thank you so much, and again, thank you for the very thoughtful and helpful comments. Um, do we have someone from the Transportation Commission? Apparently we do not. We did receive uh, a very brief uh, statement, which we can, um, I'll just read this into the record. It's, uh, it's only a paragraph. Um, on February 28th, 2019, the Transportation Commission discussed the 2016 ballot measure taxing sugar-sweetened beverages, and unanimously approved a motion recommending that the crossing guard program be the first priority for use of tax revenue, and the safe routes to school bike safety program be the second priority. Um, do we have anyone present from the Albany Unified School District? Did we, sorry, did we receive anything from them? We did not. I, I spoke with Val today, just on a separate note, and she mentioned that she had sent you something, and so can I just explain what she sent? Sure, that would be great. Um, you know, their high priority is crossing guards, mm -hmm. and their second priority was the, and I think they recommended it last year, a class at the, at the Children's Center, it's a music nutrition kind of class. Um, it, just in that brief conversation, it, it reminded me that I think that was the program recommended last year. Okay. And. So the council is aware, letters went out to the school district and to folks in the community with expertise in the health-related fields. So there was certainly an information process to gain that input. Thank you very much. Do we have anyone present who was solicited by the city to provide recommendations um, due to their expertise in public health issues or programs related to diabetes, obesity, or sugary drink consumption. Ms. Konoff? Hi, my name is Ruth Konoff. I live in Albany. Um, I believe I really received that solicitation letter um, due to my being um, having a business in occupational therapy in Albany. However, that's not what I'm going to present to you tonight. <laughs> um, I did send an email that I believe was past the deadline to be included in the packet, but I believe you've all read it. Um, and my recommendation to you tonight um, comes from the Alameda County Breastfeeding Coalition, um, of which I am an active member. Um, Everybody, I shouldn't say everybody, most of the world has gotten the idea and understands that um, breastfeeding leads to optimal health for babies. Um, many people don't know that it also has a major impact on the health of the breastfeeding mother, majorly reducing heart attacks, diabetes, high blood pressure, and a whole string of other things. Um, People know that, and um, about 97% of births in hospitals in Alameda County um, start out breastfeeding. They initiate breastfeeding. Um, by the time 
the mothers return to work or school, which around here is often quite soon. Um, despite their intentions, they often don't get to breastfeed for as long as they had planned and hoped. And it's not because they don't want to or because they no longer think it's the best thing for them, but the social structures and systems don't really do a lot to support it, even in kind of educated communities like ours. Um, so the Alameda County Breastfeeding Coalition has done some um, research and they've discovered that childcare centers and workplaces are two places in the community structures that could really do more to support families who have chosen to breastfeed. Um, and within Albany, there are seven, I'm sorry, 11 child care centers and 15 licensed child care home child care providers um, that serve children under the age of five. Um, and it would be useful for them to have support in supporting their breastfeeding families. Um, one thing the Alameda County Breastfeeding Coalition is doing is we have a um, breastfeeding friendly child care committee that is becoming more and more active. We're currently in the process actually of um, doing a needs assessment for child care providers of what they feel like they need. Um, the coalition provides training, but in some cases it's just a small thing like, oh, we need help with setting up a comfortable place for um, a parent to breastfeed their child when they drop their baby off, or a refrigerator to store everybody's breast milk because what we have now is too small, or a um, few more books that really just kind of present breastfeeding as kind of a thing people do. Um, and I confess that having gotten that letter just a couple of weeks ago, I haven't had the chance to present a real proposal with dollar figures, but I wanted to plant the seed for the council now and in the future to take some steps that make it evident that um, we join the California Department of Public Health, the World Health Organization, and every other major health organization in the world in doing some small thing to support breastfeeding. So one small thing that, since we're talking about money, um, even you know, setting up some kind of a small grants that childcare providers can um, apply for to do um, you know, some of those things that I mentioned earlier. Um, and that's about as far as I got in this. <laughs> um, so anyway, no real numbers attached to that. It wouldn't be a lot because Albany's a small city and there aren't that many childcare providers, but each of them, you know, the profit margins on those places is small and people do it because they like it, not because they're making a boatload of money. So any kind of support they can get to help them support their families, I know would be appreciated. Thank you very much. Does anyone have questions uh, for Ms. Konoff? All right, thank you. Is it Dr. Konoff? I'm sorry if I got that. Is it Dr. Konoff? I'm sorry if I got that wrong. Okay. <laughs> thank you very much. Okay, um, so I think that we have gone through the, um, the ordinances list and are ready to start taking public comment. Uh, do we have comment cards? Yes. Okay. Um, so I'll call you three at a time. Um, Annabella Thelman, not sure if um, Ruth still want to speak. Okay. Jeremiah and Nick Peterson. Uh, first off, I want to um, thank you for the opportunity to provide some input on how the money for the uh, sugar sweetened beverage tax is used. Um, my name is Annabella Feldman, and I'm in sixth grade at Albany Middle School. Um, and I have an idea on how to use that money. So the main function of the soda tax or the sugar sweetened beverage tax is to help children and adults uh, drink, la discourage 
children and adults to drink uh, sugar-sweetened beverages to try to get give them a healthy lifestyle and cut down on obesity. So I think it would make sense if some of the money goes towards helping children eat healthy. Um, so that's why I thought of this idea. So my idea is that if Albany adds um, a class into the school curriculum, it will teach students how to create a garden and then from there um, how to maintain a garden and uh, how to prepare and how to prepare um, healthy foods, which will encourage stu students to eat healthy. So Berkeley already has a curriculum like that's a lot like this. Um, so we m could possibly use their curriculum, which would mean we wouldn't have to create our own. Um, so I've been in touch with Jezra Thompson, who's the supervisor of the Berkeley Gardening and Cooking Programs, who supports the idea. And I've also been speaking with Marta Covarrubias, who's a teacher at the Albany Middle School, and she's the supervisor of an art existing garden club at the middle school, because Albany Middle School has a garden. And she says that uh, after this year, she will be working less, and she would love to help teach a program on cooking and nutrition and establishing gardens. And I've also spoken with other students at my school who believe that this idea would be very helpful to cut down on sugary foods. Um, I also like to add, as um, Chair Patterson said, um, one of her ideas was to try to get uh, children to speak at, um, had to present ideas at this. And when I saw that, I was like, Whoa. <laughs> it's kind of what I'm doing. So, so yeah. Thank you. Good job. Thank you very much, Ms. Feldman. It's really, really appreciated. Uh, council people, thank you very much for having this discussion here. I, I saw it on the e-blast and thought I would come. Just I'm just here as a, a citizen. My name's Nick Peterson. Um, so I had some question this may touch on. There's a lot of talk about uh, the schools and doing things with the schools. Is it allowed for the beverage tax to be used to assist the school district in providing uh, certain attributes in curriculum for uh, improving health? is Because that's kind of what I'm coming to suggest, and I don't know if that's all of a sudden off the table. That's something someone could answer. Well, I, I OK. You go ahead, sure. Uh, yeah, the uh, ordinance is structured as a general tax, not a special tax. So it's not restricted as to the potential uses of the fund. So the city does have authority, if the council so decided, to provide funding for programs or curricula operated by the school district. Oh, okay, good. So then, then that's relevant. So one, one thing, I have two daughters. One's already out of the school, and the other is just finishing up as a senior. And for both of them, sports programs in the middle school and the high school were very critical uh, in keeping them active and leading a much more healthy lifestyle. And there's a group called the Albany Athletic Boosters. And the last time I went to one of their meetings, which was a while ago, there was a need to see, well, how can we generate some more revenue to help the school support even more of the sports programs? And I think it's a tragedy that sports has really been hammered with, with the decrease in funding to public schools, it's, along with art and music, which are well supported in Albany, and so is athletics. But is there any way to assist with um, the athletic programs, especially in the high school? I, I find it. Um, sad that actually there's only a PE class up through sophomore year, and then of course, unless you're doing regular, you know, some kind of athletic club sport or team sport, I'm sorry, uh, there really is nothing else you can do. So, is there a way to maybe direct some of this funds towards that, towards the school athletics programs? So that's that's kind of my question. Thank you. Suggestion. Thank you very much. 
after Jeremiah would be Frank Knowles and um, Karen. Hi, good evening, Council. My name is Jeremiah. Uh, the sugar sweetened beverages tax. Uh, I see it's going two ways. You know, it's supposed to go towards education, and that's for the right reason. Um, it looks like you said you've already bought some stuff. Uh, is, is it for preschool through preschool or kindergarten? Is that uh, information, those classes through 12th grade? Um, and are those in multiple languages? There's different languages in Albany. I can imagine you guys can make a simple mistake ordering everything in English. Um, also, the water filling stations is a great idea. Um, I'm not familiar with that term. I, I was born in 1983. I grew up with water fountains. Um, and they didn't seem to use electricity. Not that I could tell. Maybe it was inside the metal casing or something. You just push a button and the water flows. Maybe those are cheaper and we can get more water fountains throughout the city instead of only focusing on these expensive filling stations that require an electricity outlet. Um, you, it's saying, I mean, earlier tonight you said you've paid for them already. So I mean, how many of those water filling stations did you buy? Um, I know the lady was talking about that there's some uh, research, there's some numbers on that already, on how much those cost. So I was wondering what those are, can the public know? Um, so I don't know how many you bought and have they been installed yet? And these water filling stations that you supposed to be bought, have they been installed? Are you still trying to figure out where to install those? Um, but if you already spent all the money, uh, I, I guess you don't have any money left over for just a water fountain. Because you could fill up your bottle in a water fountain too, because the water goes like that. I've done it my whole life. Um, so sugar sweetened beverages, it seems like some of this money did go toward the crossing guard program, which uh, to me is like, you know, an orange when we're talking about apples over here with sugar sweetened beverages taxes and this crossing guards. Um, I think, you know, if, if we're gonna just split the money up, um, I say, you know, 100% can go to crossing guards. That'd be great. Um, we do need them. Someone died on Jackson and Solano on a Monday at 1 p.m. I don't know if there was supposed to be a crossing guard there. I don't know what time they're supposed to be on duty. But so I don't know if that was a kid that died um, or an adult. But yeah, there was death over there. So, and what's your five year plan on the sugar sweetened beverages tax? You guys have a five year plan on how you're going to spend this money. You know how long you're going to keep putting money into the uh, crossing guard fund. So, um, all right, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Pinguello. Do we have more? Yes. Okay, thanks. Hi, I'm Frank Knowles, I'm an Albany resident. I have kids in Albany schools, and I'm also right now. Currently, uh, well, I've been working with Albany Little League for a long time, but I'm currently serving as the president of Albany Little League. Um, <clears throat> My proposal is more of a long-term type of proposal. Uh, there's been a lot of really great ideas here, and I, I support them all. Um, my proposal would require a bigger chunk of money than what this tax produces. But the proposal is to convert Ocean View Park and the ball field at Memorial Park to artificial turf fields. Um, this is obviously a, a big long-term project. And I'm proposing that at least some of this money be earmarked to towards that project. It's going to take a lot of funding to get it done, I would imagine. But um, we've seen a lot of proposals like for free classes in the, in the parks and stuff like that. But right now, we don't have any parks you can actually do those things because the parks have been closed thanks to the rain. In fact, our parks have been closed since about November, about mid-November. Ocean View Park just opened a week ago to use by uh, us and other users uh, in the community. Memorial Park still has not been fully opened. Uh, and uh, you know the high school baseball team that uses the field there has been practicing or theoretically practicing since the beginning of February. There's some of their season started. They still have not had one full practice on that field. And it's all because of the rain, which has caused all sorts of flooding issues and 
the fields are completely unusable. And uh, weirdly enough, it's the grass that's the problem. You go wandering out into the grass, and it's a swamp out there. The, gra the water doesn't drain for some reason out in the grass, and then the grass gets too uh, long and can't be mowed, and then it, it just creates more of a problem. And, and so we end up having situations where we have sunny days and nobody on the fields because there's just nothing but water out in the grass. So um, I think that would be a really good use of some of this money is to actually create parks that are usable. Right now, the parks are only usable for, well, they're, they're out of use because of maintenance issues and just letting the fields restore after a year of using for two to three months out of a year. So 25% of the time, you can't even use the parks here. Um, so I think that would be a good use for it. So I, I did send an email earlier today, so hopefully you'll, you'll see that eventually, but uh, explaining it a little bit better, but I think it would be a good use of this, so thanks. Thank you, Mr. Knowles. My name is Karen Holzmeister. I live on Cerrito Street, and my family and I have lived here for 59 years. Uh, as someone who is both gray-haired and obese, a lot of these programs would certainly serve me, so I look forward to a lot of the programs. I wrote you a letter which Eileen had indicated you'd received with a couple of ideas. This is involving the Albany Senior Center. Uh, I also go to Emeryville Senior Center where the firefighters come twice a month to do blood pressure and other checks, and it would be very nice if our firefighters, either through their current budget or perhaps with some subsidies, could come to the Senior Center. We have hundreds of Senior Center members who come every month. There are 261 members of the Friends of Albany Seniors, which is the nonprofit group which raises money for the center. And in fact, there are four of us here tonight who are members of FOAS. Uh, not so old looking people, would you raise your hands back there? <laughs> so that's one possibility. The other thing I mentioned in my letter is with regard to podiatry services. It would be very nice if we were included on a list also of people with information to provide to you about services because uh, the Friends of Albany Seniors does have information about needs there and background information. We did have podiatry services for a number of years, and those were by retired or semi-retired podiatrists who would volunteer their time. People would pay a small amount of money and be able to come in and have that service if they did not have it on their medical insurance. However, we are not getting those people, podiatrists, to come and help us, and so a salary would be necessary. Uh, also, I would appreciate uh, a thought that we may not be able to raise as much money, the Albany, Friends of Albany Seniors, because we just learned today, second and third hand, that the city is imposing restrictions on people who can assist us, and we will not have their assistance with the current plan of the city to not allow this volunteer group to help us at our annual luau. And we're very sorry to hear that, and we're sorry that you didn't come to us as seniors, as a member of a senior group, to say, what would you think if we do not have these individuals helping you? So we're very disappointed to hear that. I'll write you a letter on that separately because it is separate from tonight. But we hope that with hearing the needs for young people, that you'll also think of seniors in addition to the money that is already being talked about for other services. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Holtzmeister. Hi, my name is Margie Marks, and I'm here, I, wanna, I don't want to repeat what Karen said, but I'm here to reiterate what she said about the $60,000 for the Senior Center. Uh, you think, if you look at the modes of livability uh, for, in a, pe for people who are aging, health is like the number one issue. And there are a lot of insurance plans that don't cover podiatry, and it really is a necessary service for seniors. So I would really appreciate the council looking at that. Um, I think it's something that we should be providing in Albany to our seniors. I have here um, a list of 140 names of seniors who have signed a petition supporting um, getting that money. There are about 2,000 seniors that go through the Senior Center every year. 
um, you know, coming in and out of that center, they, they did a count and that's what they came up with. And I think uh, given the number of people that the senior center serves and the growing uh, population in Albany, it's about 20% of seniors, that it's a really good way to spend the money. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Marks. Are there any other public comments? Mr. Lee? Thank you for recognizing my name, my neighbor. <laughs> um, anyway, my name is Zion Lee. I lived in uh, Albany about 10 or 11 years. I'd like to support what uh, Karen and um, Aji was saying about the need to promote uh, healthy uh, methods, devices for seniors. Um, I volunteer at the senior center, and also I work part-time there. Within the last month, we have had two seniors who had suffered a stroke. And um, that's not a good sign, but of course, when you get old, what do you expect, right? But if you have something that can help seniors to monitor their health, such as uh, measuring heart uh, pressure, blood pressure, uh, that would be a big step forward. Um, we, Karen mentioned about having firemen come, and um, actually, there may be a better way, sorry, Karen. Uh, uh, we can install a blood pressure machine at the senior center. Um, Isabel was there when we had a blood pressure machine that uh, went kaput about maybe five, six years ago. And I don't know why we did not replace it, whether we didn't have money or what. But um, I thought um, having a machine is actually better than have the firemen come. Because firemen can only come at a certain time. And we have uh, at time had uh, people from Walgreen come and um, check people's blood pressure, but not all seniors can come at the appointed time. So, but if you have a machine there, uh, seniors can come and go at any time and do their measurement, and that would be very convenient, and uh, encouraging for them to do it uh, when it's so readily available. So I really encourage the um, uh, uh, council and city to look into that. Um, I don't know the actual amount that would be required, but uh, I think it would go a long way to, I myself have high blood pressure, and I, I, I like to check my blood pressure more frequently than I can do it. Okay, so thank you very much for listening. Thank you, Mr. Lee. Please. There. Thanks for having this uh, session to hear our views. I'm Sonia Herbert, and I've been an Albany resident for 20 plus years. I'm also a public health professional. I have taught at Berkeley and Stanford Public Health. But around obesity prevention, I had two roles. One was to work with uh, California communities and communities around the country, largely as a contractor for the Center for Disease Control to help communities prioritize what they should be doing around obesity prevention and reviewing federal grants about how money should be used around obesity prevention. So this sort of small pool of money, what do we do with it, is what I've spent the last 20 years on. So I thought I should say something. Um, Positively, the best things we can do priority-wise are environmental changes that stay put. So the water fountain stations are wonderful. Crossing guards and anything that physically changes the environment, all of the complete streets and walkability studies that make the environment have permanent changes that allow for physical activity in a safe way or much more lasting changes than, than short-term programs that would need to be continually funded. So I just want to, as an overarching principle for your debates, think of things that can change the environment for permanent healthy access. Um, with that, I want to say that the water fountains have been a huge hit in our household. My seven-year-old yesterday had a play date you know, this is a big deal. What do you want to do on a play date? The sky's the limit, you know? 
And he said, I want to show them something really, really cool that's a surprise. But everyone has to close their eyes. So if you imagine four of us with little hands held walking down the greenway for the big surprise. And he brings us all up to the water fountain. And we get to open our eyes. And he takes us on a tour of it. And where we can put our bottles. And that one kid can be filling the bottle. And one kid being, can be drinking for the water fountain. And if we had brought the dog, the dog could be drinking at the same time. So it's a huge challenge and has made a big difference in our family. So I just wanted to share that, you know, lovely story that if given all the things to do in Albany, showing off the water fountain was what he chose, which says something about Jasper, but there you go. Um, and as public health professionals, I also, I volunteer in the schools um, to teach PE once a week to the first graders. And I um, love doing it. I'm an athlete by nature. But it also is one of those clear indications of the funding shortage in schools, that there aren't enough PE teachers or funding for that to even meet the minimum standards that the schools need. Um, you know, in California of minutes exercised in the school. So I do, I'm, I'm fairly shocked that there isn't a report um, from the school district on how they want to use some funding to improve uh, health in the schools. since the main reason I'm in this building is about the budget crisis in the school. So um, I just want to thank you for the opportunity to talk and encourage you to fund as a priority environmental changes. Thank you, Ms. Herbert. You can tell uh, Jasper, he's not alone. The, um, the water filling, water, I understand the water bottle filling stations in Paris are a huge tourist attraction. Uh, they're really wildly popular. OK. Um, so I think we have no further public comment. I only see one or two folks who have not spoken, and they're not raising their hands. So I think it's time to bring it back to council. Before we begin the discussion, I do want to mention that um, Vice Mayor McQuaid is a member of a couple of organizations that have been nominated for funding um, by, by one or more groups. And um, I feel her participation is so valuable. She should be part of this discussion, uh, but she will not uh, speak to the prioritization of those, of any funding going to those particular organizations. Do you want to identify the organizations and your role just for disclosure? The uh, two organizations listed here is the Albany Y, and I serve on the board of managers. And in the bike safety program, it does reference the APAL Bicycle Rodeo, and I serve on their board. APAL being the Albany Police Activities League. Um, but I think Mayor, uh, Vice Mayor McQuaid has been uh, in, probably involved in practically every exercise thing that has happened in Albany for, uh, for the past several decades. So um, back to the council. Um, would anybody like to kick it off? Um, well, you're looking at me, so I'll take the bait and uh, go right ahead. Thank you. Um, I'll try to keep this as brief as possible, because I know we're, we're going to run short on time since we're all going to give comments. Um, so we are, I'm so grateful and we're so lucky that we we're able to pass the soda tax in this uh, town. Um, the, we're one of only four in California and a handful elsewhere uh, in the United States, although um, internationally uh, they've become much more popular. Uh, and uh, as some I know, the um, soda lobby uh, threatened the California legislature with trying to implement a, uh, trying to make it harder for them to pass taxes. And so uh, the legislature passed a moratorium on any other soda taxes from any other city in California. Uh, but the good news is that there are those who are mobilizing for a California uh, statewide uh, soda tax, uh, I think, in, in 2020. Uh, one thing that I'll continue to um, press upon people is that soda taxes are, um, sugar sweetened beverage taxes are under attack uh, uh, still, and that one let's, of the ways, yeah. 
keep our focus on, you know, priority. We're, we've got uh, only a little over 20 I'm, I'm getting there. So one of the ways that we can make sure that we support them is to uh, keep a focus on children's health. And uh, so I'm in favor of the, um, the items here that most closely uh, uh, revolve around children's health or health in general, um, although I am I think I find it compelling that there were a few incident, few um, suggestions for serving low income uh, populations as well, and I count that probably some seniors among that. So um, given all that, I'd say that my priorities continue to be filling out the water bottle filling stations uh, wherever it makes sense. I'll note that there's only one, uh, two permanent ones in the um, in city buildings, I believe, in uh, the rec in community center and the um, maintenance center. I would love to see one here in city hall and one at the senior center because I think that they. Uh, Represent. They make a big impression for those who who use those facilities that we we care about this issue. And then all the other suggestions I've heard for placement sound great as well. Um, the uh, programs for nutrition and cooking and any of the um, items around food and health sound great. Fitness sound great. Um, I am, though, struck by the fact that it does appear that a bike safety program uh, is losing some funding, if I read this correctly. So all this, though the, the nexus might be a little less good here, I would support uh, um, funding the bike, sh uh, sorry. Did I say bike sharing? I meant uh, the bi bike safety is what I meant. I think I said that. Um, Bike sharing, I think, is also good, but maybe uh, less of a nexus. So health, gardening, nutrition, cooking, uh, and the bike safety, uh, second to uh, filling out or completing all the filling stations. I think I can leave it there. Thank you. Council Member Barnes. Yeah, um, <clears throat> I pretty much find my self in agreement with uh, Nick. You know, my recollection was when we discussed this at length a few years ago, we, I, at least my recommendations then are still are that we focus on public health as opposed to medical interventions and we focus more on, on children because that's where you have the most long lasting uh, effect. So sure, the water filling stations seem to be a hit but the one thing I wanted to point out is, you know, in the summers now, all the kids in Albany are pretty much ours. The school district has them for nine months, but we have them for three months. And so if we're going to spend money on classes or activities for kids, I think we need to focus on the summers because that's when they really need the activity. Speaking as a former single parent, believe me, I would go bananas in the summers trying to keep my kid busy and people spend a lot of money. Um, so I'm not a big fan of handing the money to the school district. I think the school district, frankly, needs to get its own house in order. I won't say anything more than that. But the real need is in the summer anyway, and so I would like to target any programs for youth to the summer. That being said, some of the ideas for seniors, I think, really sound good. Um, mobile clinics, mobile dental clinics, which w would serve all ages. And I'm wondering if we couldn't explore other sources or piggyback on programs that might exist in Berkeley and Oakland to see if we could just get them to come a little further north. But, uh, you know, Obamacare, for all sorts of reasons, never covered dental. And Dr. Dennis, they think that's crazy. And so there's still a crying need for, for dental care in society. And that's, that, you know, as far as the prioritization below that level, I really think that's up to Parks and Rec and the staff. I don't really have strong feelings about the priorities, but as long as they're focused on kids in the summer. Council Member Moss. Okay, thank you. A, a, a lot of great ideas being thrown, uh, thrown around. I, I mean, uh, the regret is that this is a 
kind of limited amount of money, then we can't fund everything and we can't do justice to, to um, all of them. Um, a, a lot of my motivation is still bound by the the impetus for this tax um, when it first got on the ballot, which was mostly focused on uh, children's uh, health. Um, and uh, you, know, I, you know, even though we made this a general tax that could be spent anywhere, I'm still kind of holding true to this belief that it should be mostly aimed at, at young people because the damage done by uh, sugar-sweetened beverages is really does start on, on youth. Um, I'd, I'd like the comments about, um, uh, you know, the most productive way to do things is on, um, and, uh, what is it, permanent environmental changes. Uh, you know, things that we put out there, be they water bottle fillers or, um, um, you know, whatever kind of program, some of the parks and rec ideas I thought were great. I, I really thought they did a lot of work at putting together a chain of things that, that I think reflected uh, what we thought about when we did the um, uh, tax initially. Um, you know, I, I love the idea around field improvements. I, too, had, had a kid that was involved in sports in Albany. Um, I do see all those next door um, uh, announcement that the fields are once again closed because they're 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 just too wet to play on. Uh, I'm sure that's going on in Berkeley and other places. Um, as many know, I've been a long a long time advocate of getting a turf field at the um, uh, uh, Peggy Thompson Pierce Street Park on the big flat area out there. That's has nothing on it. Uh, I mean, ultimately, it would be great to, I think, do turf fields at Ocean View, at Memorial, in any of the places that kids are using on a regular basis, and we just need more fields. Uh, anybody that's had a kid that played soccer or baseball or any of those sports knows that it's very competitive to get that, that kind of uh, space. Um, but again, that's one of those things that they're really expensive, and we don't have very much money here to, to deal with. So um, perhaps they could be, uh, you know, some of this could go towards the costs of looking into these fields or or, or maybe some kind of initial way of, of, of working on that kind of thing it would be preferable for me. Um, and then, you know, the one thing which, it, you know, it came up on some of these suggestions, but we the biggest chunk of change has gone towards the crossing guard program, which is a, a great program. I'm not against the crossing guard program, but I've always thought it, it seemed a bit of a um, convenience to be able to take money out of this particular funds that I, I thought a little inappropriate. I, I firmly think that the city is, should be obliged to pay for that program. It would be great if the schools could chip in, but I don't see that happening realistically. However, I, I would love to see us pull money from other places uh, to get that going and maybe even expand it to, say, up on Solano and Jackson, where there was an accident recently. Um, and I would make a suggestion at this time around in funding that maybe we cut back on some of the money we've given into the crossing guard program from this plot of money and come up with the the monies we need for the for the rest of it from somewhere else in our, our budget. I mean, we have a, I, I know it's, it's, it's challenging to do that, but we do have a, what, a roughly $25 million budget, and if we can't come up with $20,000 from someplace else to, to supplement that, uh, you know, I'm not sure why, uh, we wouldn't be able to do that. Um, Otherwise, I, uh, you know, like I say, I, not to, to parse it down into specifics, but I think many of the ideas that Parks and Rec came up with, I thought were, were very good. Thank you. Vice Mayor McQuaid. Okay, um, I think just to go down the list here, um, I think doing more water bottle fillers is great. I do support the Crossing Guard program. Uh, I, I'm not, I think funding it fully from this fund is fine if we want to funded from other funds, you know, all money's green, so it really doesn't matter at the end of the day. I was a little hesitant about the exercise and nutrition classes because they haven't started, but hearing how successful 
the signups are. I think they're great. Uh, let's see, I can't talk about bike safety. Uh, I'd like perhaps a little more information from staff on a mobile medical clinic, what that would, what that would look like and how we'd fund it and, and more information. The same with the dental clinic. I'd like to know also if we have an idea how many children would be benefiting from that. I think that the wellness clinic and the podiatry services at the senior center should be funded. Um, I think they should be funded out of the general fund, not out of this money. I think, I think they're really necessary and they should have a, a little stronger funding source. Uh, what else? The healthy snacks for the after school program. I think, again, that's something that should be provided. It shouldn't be coming out of this source. Uh, we, d we do meals on wheels. So if, if, and this dinner at the senior center, if we need more funding, maybe we could get some information about that. Uh, T-shirts, I, I don't think are a really good use of this fund. It seems like too little bang for our buck. Uh, the installation of public restrooms, I'd like to see looked at through the HEAP funds. Uh, let's see, I think, and as far as the teen competition, I think um, that's a great idea. I think, um, I can't remember her name, but Ms. Um, our little sixth grader who was here did an excellent job. Uh, we are working on outreach to teens, which we'll be rolling out in the next couple of months, and I'd like to include that in that, in that program. And I think that's all I have for now. Thank you. Okay. Um, I was and remain a very uh, strong advocate of the crossing guard program. And my rationale is this. I agree with Mr. Barnes. Uh, we, have, we have the kids during the summer. But th probably one of the most key things that the city does for children, apart from summer uh, and some after school, uh, related programs uh, associated with the Parks and Recreation Department um, is that we offer uh, an opportunity to get to and from schools in a safe and healthy manner that in an hopefully um, inculcates in young people the idea that you walk or bike whenever you can and gets them into that habit early in life and makes it a regular part of every day. The Crossing Guard program is an essential part of uh, getting kids safely to school um, without being driven by their parents. I would go kind of in the other direction from what one, some have suggested. I would be looking at the bike safety and the walking school buses um, and doing everything that we can, creating programs for competitions, for you know the most kids um, getting to school without being driven there. I would love to see us do more for safe routes to school. But um, definitely uh, the crossing guard program, and I'd hate to see it become something that goes up and down, that we, you know, and it, it, there could come a time when there isn't enough money, and we'd be delighted if there wasn't enough money from sugar-sweetened beverages to pay for the crossing guard program. But until that day arrives, I personally would, would want to see it be a, a core use. Um, water bottle fillers, I'm, I'm with others on that. On the seniors' issues, I do feel passionately we should have uh, a full we should have a full service senior center and we should be looking at all of the needs of our seniors, podiatry and uh, blood pressure testing and so forth. Um, but I do agree with those who say that this funding source uh, should probably be focused on children based on um, people's understandings and expectations uh, about this, uh, the reason for it. And I would hope that we could look for other opportunities, including grant funding for something like um, blood pressure testing at the senior center um, and, and podiatry. Uh, the breastfeeding comments were uh, really the first time it's ever come across my radar screen that the city might have a role in trying to um, promote breastfeeding. And I, I love the idea, but I don't know enough about it or the, 
I, I don't think it's quite ripe, but I think it's something that I'm delighted to hear brought up and hope that we will explore further, but probably not this particular source uh, in this particular budget. Um, I also really was impressed with Ms. Feldman and her presentation, having a, a, a member of our target uh, uh, beneficiary group come and talk about uh, what is needed was, uh, was very heartening. But as with other school, th this she seems to be talking about a school-based activity, and with school-based activities, I don't have a great idea of everything that is going on, what gardens are currently being utilized, what opportunities are kids being given um, to garden now and to take cooking classes now. Uh, so again, I'd probably say, well, maybe in the future that's another thing to look at, but perhaps not this funding source uh, in this cycle. And um, gee, there was another item I did want to mention, I think I just wanted to mention overall that I think that Albany, and, and this goes a little bit to um, Council Member Pilch's comments, I think that one difference between Albany and some of the other cities that have imposed soda, sugar sweetened beverage taxes, is that Albany is an exceptionally highly educated place. Uh, when you look at our housing element, one of the things you see is that uh, a lot of our low-income households are concentrated in the village. And they're, that means they're graduate students. They're not low-income because they, are, uh, they don't have enough education to earn more. They are low-income because they're, they're graduate students and they're going through a period of their life of low-income that, that is not going to last. I'm not saying we don't have low-income people who are, are long-term low-income, but I think that Generally, we are a highly educated community. And for that reason, I'm not as motivated to try to educate people about the, the dangers of sugar-sweetened beverages. People should, should know that. We should do things to get the word out, especially to children, and especially to English learners who might not be getting the message uh, from the same channels that, that the rest of the, the population is but I, I don't see it as the kind of desperate need that it is in a lot of cities that have sugar-sweetened beverage taxes. So that's why I, I would see it putting more towards exercise um, and getting kids to school on their feet or on their bikes um, safely. So um, to, yeah, go ahead. I think Nick has a question also. Oh yes, yeah, so just to respond to that, I mean in general I agree that people know uh, what the right things to do are, but um, forming the habits is uh, another thing. So the cooking classes, for example, teach people how to make sure they stay eating healthy and um, gardening can give that closer connection between people and their and their food. So in, if those are educational programs, I think those are those are indeed uh, appropriate even in a, in a city like ours. And uh, just finally, I want to say that um, I also echo the idea that we should find a permanent funding source for the school crossing guard program, which I support, outside of the sugar sweetened beverage tax eventually. Uh, I, 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 I urge the staff to start thinking about that um, because eventually that funding might might go away, uh, but we still do want to fund that program. Thanks. Thank you. And I, I'd like to add on one more thought too. The, you know, the, the, that funding is, if you look at the chart, and this is just one year versus another year, and what happens next, the next fiscal year, we don't know, but the funding has gone down a little bit. Um, I, you know, I would love to th be able to think that that's because kids are drinking less soda in, in Albany. Who knows? You you can't you can't really make that kind of correlation. Uh, but it is not a, a necessarily a permanent funding. So whatever we fund, um, we may not have that kind of money in four, five, ten years. So uh, we have to we have yeah. to kind of keep that in the back of our brains as we. Yep. Look forward. Very much agree with all these points. Vice Mayor McQuaid. So uh, my question to staff is, before this comes back to us, can you 
at least have an idea about some of these programs at the senior center, if, if there's another way to fund them. Because for me, that will influence how I feel about the sugar sweet and beverage tax. Is that possible? Yeah, that's definitely possible. Okay. It's part of the overall analysis that we'll conduct okay. before your one of your May meetings. That that'll all be part of the proposed expenditure plan, and if there's other funding sources. Okay. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Wonderful. So I have a question for the staff now. Do you feel like you have heard enough to work up something for us to chew on when we uh, come back to this topic? Absolutely. Thank you for asking. Um, yeah, I've heard consensus on some items and some items that may need a little bit more discussion in terms of where they fall in priorities. And so we'll prepare a draft expenditure plan that the council can then weigh additionally and discuss and make sure it fits before we build anything into the budget process. All right, thank you Thanks. very much. Any final comments from the council? Oh, we got two then I think we have uh, about two minutes if uh, anybody needs a break. We'll start again in uh, maybe three minutes. All right, got a lot to do in three minutes.
We begin with ceremonial matters, and our first ceremonial matter is a proclamation honoring the Rotary Club's 90th birthday. Proclamation. Whereas the Albany Rotary Club was admitted to Rotary International on March 18, 1929, and whereas the Albany Rotary Club was provided the citizens has provided the citizens of the city of Albany with 90 years of continuous community service, and whereas the Albany Rotary Club has continued to exemplify the motto of Rotary International, service above self, and whereas the Albany Rotary Club has sponsored or contributed to local projects for the past 90 years, including Joe Villa scholarships for students graduating from Albany high schools, Albany Little League and Albany Berkeley girls softball league sponsorships, home team, home improvements for local senior citizens, local beautification projects, Solano Avenue bench repair and painting, books donated to all Albany Unified School District school libraries, Rotacare medical clinic in Richmond for uninsured community members, local youth organizations, Whereas the Albany Rotary Club has sponsored or contributed to international projects for the past 90 years, including Rotary International Foundation, Worldwide Eradication of Polio, Rotavision training doctors to perform eye surgery in less developed countries, Kenya Smiles, bringing dental care to the children of Kenya, Rotoblast, cleft palate surgeries for less developed countries, <coughs> LN4 uh, hands, hand prosthesis for landmine victims, Burkina Faso water and education projects in Africa, engineers without borders, improvements to schools in Mexico, working with partners in surgery in Guatemala, including donating a portable ultrasound machine to assist in their work, now, therefore, be it proclaimed that the Albany City Council congratulate the Albany Rotary Club on its 90 years and appreciate the services and contributions both locally and internationally. Thank you, council and staff, for recognition via this proclamation. We look forward to many more decades of community service. Thank you. Thank you. And our next proclamation is in honor of National Crime Victims' Rights Week. And I understand we have a representative from the district attorney's office, uh, if you'd meet me at the podium. City of Albany Proclamation in honor of National Crime Victims' Rights Week, April 7th to 13th, 2019. Whereas more than 26 million people become victims of crime each year, and these crimes also affect family members, friends, neighbors, and coworkers. And whereas the Alameda County Victim Witness Division is dedicated to ensuring the rights of crime victims and their families by providing services to aid in their recovery from the emotional, psychological, social, and economic impacts of crime as they reclaim their sense of safety, well-being, and dignity. And whereas the victim witness staff assists victims of crime without regard to a person's race, gender, religion, nationality, sexual orientation, and gender identity or immigration status. And whereas victims are faced with many challenges as a result of crime, 
Oftentimes, victims enter systems that fail to meet their needs, provide appropriate services, or fail to treat them with the dignity and respect they deserve. And involving survivors helps victim service providers and criminal justice professionals understand the culture, values, and expectations of underserved and unserved victims who seek assistance and justice. And whereas the Alameda County District Attorney's Office Victim Witness Assistance Program was the first such program in the nation established in 1974 and continues to join forces with the victim service providers, criminal justice agencies, and concerned citizens throughout Alameda County and America to raise awareness of victims' rights and observe National Crime Victims' Rights Week. And whereas, in 1984, the Crime Victims Fund was established by the Victims of Crime Act to provide a permanent source of support for crime victim services and compensation. And whereas, the Alameda County District Attorney's Office was the first in the nation to create a Victim Witness Assistance Division and survivors, community service providers, criminal justice professionals, and victim advocates are working together to enhance a criminal justice system response that is accessible, culturally competent, and appropriate for all victims of crime. And whereas, in 2018, the Alameda County District Attorney's Office Victim Witness Assistance Division provided over 891 services to more than 110 crime victims, including but not limited to child victims of violence and sexual abuse, stalking victims, survivors of homicide victims, human trafficking, crimes against elders and dependent adults, sexual assault, domestic violence, robbery, and other crimes. And whereas, the Victim Witness Assistance Claims Division assisted more than 3,393 victims of crime in receiving state compensation funds, successfully compensated 2 million nine hundred and sixty nine thousand five hundred and seventy five dollars which paid for services for victims of crime without independent means and the Alameda County District Attorney's Office successfully secured restitution orders in the amount of eight million four hundred and forty five thousand four hundred and forty one of that amount forty uh, one and end of that amount, $7,410,927.88 was ordered for victims of crime and their families, and $642,680.74 was ordered to the state of California. <laughs> Sorry, the, the sense threw me. Um, to the state of, of California Victim Compensation Program. And whereas, the Alameda County District Attorney's Office has been a leader in outreach and services to underserved populations, including commercial sexual exploitation of children, sexual assault victims from cold hit DNA cases, immigrant victims, urban youth, and victims in the LGBTQ community, as well as victims with disabilities, such as deaf and hard of hearing. And whereas, National Crime Victims' Rights Week, April 7th to 13th, 2019, provides an opportunity to celebrate the energy, creativity, and commitment that launched the victims' rights movement, inspired its progress, and continues to advance the cause of justice for crime victims. Now, therefore, the city, the Albany City Council hereby proclaims the week of April 7th to 13th, April 7th to 13th, 2019, as the National Crime Victims' Rights Week and reaffirm the City of Albany's commitment to respect and enforce victims' rights and address their needs during Victims' Rights Weeks and throughout the year, and express our appreciation for those victims and survivors of crime who have turned personal tragedy into a motivating force to improve the response to victims of crime and build a more just community. Thank you. It's an incredibly impressive program. 
Thank you so much. On behalf of the District Attorney's Office and the Victims of Crime Unit in Alameda County, I just want to thank the City of Albany, the Council, um, for recognizing us this year. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, we turn to the report on action taken in closed session, if any. Uh, we gave guidance to staff and will um, continue that, uh, that discussion. Consent calendar. Consent calendar items are considered to be routine by the city council and will be enacted by one motion. By approval of the consent calendar, the staff recommendations will be adopted unless otherwise modified by the city council. There will be no separate discussion on these items unless a city council member or a member of the audience requests removal of the items from the consent calendar. Do we have any requests for removal? No. And uh, do we ha does any member of the audience wish to pull an item from the consent calendar? I'll move approval of consent with the comment, this is the shortest consent calendar I've ever seen. <laughs> Second. Councilmember Barnes? Yes. Councilmember Moss? Yes. Councilmember Pilch? Yes. Vice Mayor McQuay? Yes. Mayor Nason? Yes. And the motion carries. So we turn to good of the city and public comment. This section of the agenda is for persons desiring to address the city council on an item that is not on the agenda. Please note that city policy limits each speaker to up to three minutes. Um, the, uh, the time limit may be reduced depending on the number of speakers. The Brown Act limits the council's ability to take or discuss items that are not on the agenda. Therefore, such items are normally referred to staff for comment or to a future agenda. All persons wishing to speak on an item on the agenda should fill out speaker cards and provide to the city clerk. Comments related to items appearing on the agenda are taken up at the time the city council deliberates on those action items. And um, we will uh, announce when the public comment is open on each agenda item. Do we have cards for uh, good of the city? Okay. Jeremiah? Hi, good evening, Council. I'd like to make a public comment here today, the City Council meeting, because this is the only opportunity that the public gets to speak on anything they want that's not on the agenda. And uh, I don't know how long school zones has been a hobby of mine. Uh, by now, it's definitely a hobby at this point. Um, school zones. It's, it's in the index or the glossary in any other uh, city's um, <clears throat> municipal code book. Look in the front of the uh, municipal code book or the back, it's either glossary or the index. I think it's the index. Um, <clears throat> school zones, it says what page to go to. It's right there, school zone, flip right to it. It says there's a reduced speed, 15 miles an hour, uh, <clears throat> double fines for traffic violations. So please uh, keep uh, up and on for those, those kids that can't speak up for themselves, that can't come to these meetings, have a difficulty time getting here. Also, uh, are you guys gonna do the Civics Academy this year? I know last year you didn't wanna do it. Um, I was wondering if you're gonna do it this year. Uh, the pedestrian that died on Jackson and Solano I don't know if that was uh, an adult or a kid, but I believe it was around 1 p.m. on a Monday. And is that intersection supposed to have a crossing guard? It's terrible for it to be a, a child or an adult or a senior or anybody. I don't know what that intersection needs. More signage, more speed bumps. It's terrible someone dying, getting hit, and 
run over by a car. Imagine if that was a child, let's say. I don't know who it is. Could have been a child on the way to and from school. You don't even have school zones. Ouch. Was there a crossing guard on duty? Was there supposed to be one? Didn't show up for work? The police department used to be crossing guards. You'll need to wrap up. Got five seconds left. Well, the Gill Track Farm is amazing. Thank you. Lane? Hello. Uh, first, I just want to thank the city of Albany. It's the most beautiful city in the world. It's um, my harbor, and I love living here. But today, I want to thank Cesar Chavez, born Cesar Estrada Chavez. He created the United Farm Workers Union. And today is his day. And I just want to honor them. And them, I mean all the workers that pick our food, that we buy at Sprouts or Safeway or Lucky's, and I just want to thank them. And it's a holiday in California. It's not a federal holiday, but it should be. Thank you. Thank you. Do we have any other speakers for good of the city? Uh, seeing none, we will move on to council member reports on state, regional, local meetings attended and announcement of future meetings, plus the city manager's report. So let's begin with council member reports. Vice Mayor McQuaid, do you want to begin since you actually did a written report this month? I did do a, a written report. It, it's attached. It's very simple. It's self-explanatory. Um, it does report on the East Bay Community Energy Meeting that I at attended as uh, Council Member Pilch's alternate. I also attended the Solano Avenue Association Mixer where we kicked off our business resiliency program. And I also had the honor of going to Sacramento and receiving with the Recreation Department the California Park and Recreation District two, two awards. So that's what I've done. Thank you. Council Member Pilch. Thank you. I also went to the uh, SAA annual mixer, attended films at the Film Fest. Yay for another wonderful Film Fest. Um, I, on Sunday, I believe it was Sunday, I attended a um, presentation in El Cerrito about El, Cer El Cerrito's urban forest and got some um, ideas there that I'll bring back to the city and the council. Uh, but uh, finally, at the end of last week, I attended three days of the California Association of Local Economic Development Conference in, uh, in Anaheim and was very jazzed by all the um, ideas that I was able to get there in the context as, as I, was, I was able to make. And I'll have much more to say on that and hopefully a presentation to uh, share with the council and others at a later date. Thank you. Wonderful. Thank you. Uh, Council Member Moss? No. Nothing? Okay. Council Member Barnes? Well, I um, attended the two schmooze fests that the rest of the council attended, the Solano Avenue Association and the uh, Albany Film Fest events. They were fun. <laughs> yes, the, the gala was, uh, was a delight. Uh, many thanks to Mechanics Bank for making that possible for all of us. Um, 
several of us attended the opening uh, ceremony for the Blue Loop, uh, which has become uh, controversial among some, but is also developing quite a constituency, especially among pretty much every child who lays eyes on it. You can't really uh, look at it if you're below a certain age without wanting to climb on the thing. So um, I think that that bodes well for the future. That's part of the idea. Yeah, yeah. Um, I have been to several um, uh, events in my capacity with the East Bay Regional Park District for the Alameda County Mayors, which included a, um, uh, a strategic planning workshop, which was uh, educational, considering that we're talking strategic planning today. I also attended a tour of the Tilden Park nature area, and although it's not in Albany, it's certainly a place that Albany people enjoy, and there are some great plans up there. Um, and finally, the, uh, the Park Advisory Commission. I've also been to meetings of Stop Waste and of the Alameda County Transportation Coalition. Um, none of those meetings involved things specific to Albany, uh, but they do ha they they did cover issues that may be of interest, and I will I will post links for that. Um, oh, and we welcomed a new uh, uh, real estate business. Uh, Vice Mayor McQuaid and I went to help uh, cut the ribbon for Kingship Realty. So, City Manager, do we have reports? Yeah, I have a. A lengthy, a little bit more beefy report today, so bear with me. Our police department has been actively engaged in uh, promoting awareness to our community. They did a forensic crime scene class for a bi biology class at the high school. They also did an active shooter safety training at the church on the corner on Solano. Here's a picture from that training. Uh, and we also welcomed a new police administrative specialist, Patricia Gomez, as well as a new police officer, Holly Matthews. They both start this week. Um, one more flyer here. AC Boost, funded by Alameda County Measure 1 and approved by our taxpayers, is a supportive program to help with um, funding for homes. So the website here is um, acboost.org for more information. And also um, two other new hires we have, Jose Remo, who is in our recreation department, and Claire Miller, who is a youth services leader. We also um, have the Climate Action and Adaptation Plan at the next Climate Action Committee meeting. 6.30 on Wednesday, April 17th. It'll be a study session to review the draft strategies for the updated climate action and adaptation plan. We'll have a public comment period for the draft plan likely to begin in mid-May and a council study session in June on that topic. Um, you will see some pavement work coming your way soon through our Public Works Department. Um, the approval that Council gave earlier this year, uh, that work will begin in mid-April and continue through the end of June. So bear with us during the construction as we continue to improve our streets. Um, we also um, did some repairs to Ocean View Park Field. I know that was mentioned earlier in our study session. Uh, for the Little League season, it included new sod in select locations, upgrades to the irrigation system, and rebuilding the infield. So they are now ready to play ball. So thank you. Thank you. Any final, final comments from the council? Okay, then we will move on. Uh, we have no presentations tonight, so we go directly to our public hearing. Tonight's public hearing is on proposed amendments to Chapter 5, Section 5-24 of the Albany Municipal Code, Tobacco Real, Real ta Retailer License to Prohibit the Sale of Flavored Tobacco Projects. May we have a staff report, please? Uh, council members, uh, I'm going to present the staff report uh, tonight. The um, flavored tobacco products ordinance has been before the city council twice. Uh, initially in September, you opened a public hearing on the proposed ordinance. 
and ultimately continue that for further analysis and information by staff. Uh, you had a study session on December 3rd where you received additional information and testimony from expert witnesses uh, in the health care <coughs> fields about the impacts of flavored tobacco, pro tobacco products on youth uh, primarily. And as a result of those uh, conversations and input received by the city, um, we've revised the ordinance. Uh, many of the changes are technical, but the two primary categories of revisions are some expanded recitals that summarize the uh, expert information on health impacts of flavored tobacco products. So I've added that into the recitals to explain uh, further the basis for the ordinance. Uh, secondarily, the, the uh, definitions have been expanded and some of the terms that were not previously defined are now defined. And uh, that was largely adapted from the model ordinance uh, circulated by Change Lab Solutions um, that has been used by uh, many of the cities that have adopted ordinances in this area. One thing I'll point out, it's not a change, but it, it is a, a, a aspect of this ordinance that maybe is noteworthy, and that's there's a six month uh, delayed effective date. Ordinarily an ordinance uh, takes effect 30 days after second reading. Uh, this one has a six month waiting period. Uh, and the purpose of that is to alleviate the impact on tobacco retailers by giving them a chance to sell out their existing inventory. Um, where the ordinance takes uh, full effect as enforced. Uh, there are some additional changes that are not reflected in the um, proposed changes that are not reflected in the red line ordinance. The uh, County of Alameda and the American Cancer Society uh, suggested additional changes to set a minimum package size and minimum prices for tobacco products. Those really only relate to non-flavored tobacco products so I, I did not include them in the ordinance absent further council direction because they seemed outside the scope of what uh, you had asked us to do. Um, if the council does wish to pursue those issues, then I'd suggest either continuing the hearing to allow time to prepare uh, revisions to the ordinance or considering that as a separate issue at some future date. Uh, finally, there was an email that came in uh, just a short time ago from Gaurav Bali, uh, an attorney who's present here tonight representing Better Cloud, a retailer on San Pablo Avenue. I'll let him explain his changes, but they basically fall into three categories. Uh, one would be to ex exempt stores that uh, only allow uh, adults, uh, persons over 21 years old, to enter the premises. Uh, the second uh, proposed ordinance revision would be to grandfather existing stores. Um, and the third would be to set up a spacing requirement of stores not, that sell these products not being allowed to locate within 600 feet of certain designated sensitive uses such as playgrounds, libraries, things of that nature. Um, so that's essentially my report. I'd be happy to answer any questions. Are there any questions from the council? Um, you know, I, I think I know what it means, but could you define it, this minimum packaging size concept? This is a, a, a package would have to, be, uh, couldn't be any smaller than a certain amount, or it couldn't be any, have more items? Uh, couldn't be any smaller. It'd be a, a, min, a minimum size. The uh, Currently under uh, state law, there's a minimum pack size for cigarettes. I think it's 20 cigarettes. Uh, cigarettes defined as a product that's rolled in paper. Okay. It doesn't, that minimum package size did not apply to cigar, cigars or cigarillos, which are wrapped in a tobacco leaf. So that's viewed by some as maybe a loophole in that requirement. The, the other uh, provision that would apply to both cigarettes and cigars and cigarillos is the minimum pricing. And the, the, the basis for those recommendations is that um, it's easier for uh, youth to, who don't, may not have a lot of money to buy maybe a smaller quantity of, of tobacco products, uh, you know, not buying them directly, but perhaps buying them from an intermediary and easier to get access to the products if they can buy a smaller quantity uh, at one time. So the thought would be try to discourage um, uh, tobacco use by youth uh, by making it essentially more expensive. You have to buy either a minimum number of products or a minimum uh, price. Do you have any idea, was that based on um, some kind of surveys or, or was this just sort of, well, this, we think this is what's going to happen if we, if we have this kind of law? I think it's uh, maybe more the latter. I don't want to um, 
I don't want to minimize the concerns, but I, uh, there, those provisions have been included in some other ordinances. I don't know that there's been uh, the type of comprehensive analysis that's been done for flavored tobacco products. I mean, you heard some very detailed testimony about the impacts of flavored tobacco products. There have been recent uh, pronouncements from the FDA on, on that topic. So there, I think there is more of a, a breadth of information on flavored tobacco products than there is on these other uh, measures that are proposed. Okay, thank you. I just want to say if you do Blue Glove crew and some of us have volunteered. Do you find these little foil packages this long, which have sort of th four big cigarettes, but they're really cigarellos, and they're all over the streets and they drive me crazy. And um, so they actually are very popular. And I do think at some point we want, might want to look at regulating them more tightly. But I, I agree with Craig that they're a little they're a separate topic, and I think we can look at that later. Uh, Vice Mayor McQuaid, any questions? No, I'm good. Council Member Pilch. Okay. Um, in terms of this procedural question, is that something we can take up and discuss prior to taking public hearings so that we can, uh, d if, if we're going to defer, if, if it's the Council's pleasure to defer this hearing to another date, is that something we can determine ahead of public comment or? Uh, well, you could, but I think I'd recommend since people have come to speak to this topic that you give them an opportunity to be heard. And then at the conclusion of the public hearing, the council can deliberate and decide uh, how you want to proceed. Why don't we do it that way then? I, I agree that people who are here should be able to um, say their piece, but then if we do end up deferring it, there might be people who'd like to uh, to take off and uh, come back on another day uh, when, if we're going to hear it again. But why don't we offer everyone the chance to speak at this point? Uh, do we have cards? Okay, let's go. We'll call three at a time. Jeremiah, Paul Cummings, and Liz Williams. Hi, good evening, Council. Uh, I just want to say that this is a very important topic um, I do not uh, consume alcohol, I mean, I'm sorry, tobacco products. Um, I don't smoke cigarettes. I don't chew dip. Um, I don't smoke liquid uh, nicotine, whatever that stuff is, uh, that kills you, gives you cancer. Pay all that money to kill yourself doesn't make much sense. Uh, my mom has smoked cigarettes, so that was something I didn't like. Growing up as a kid, you know, um, she would cook and then while holding a cigarette, and I'm pretty sure some ash probably fell in my tomato soup with my grilled cheese sandwich. But anyway, um, so, and it, cigarettes is a terrible thing. I mean, it's really terrible. Um, I mean, as a kid, you know, I'm in the back seat and then the ash flies out the front window, it hits me in the face in the back. I mean, I can imagine all those kids out there that are like, three months old, and their mom's pushing them in a stroller with a cigarette. You got one cigarette in the hand while pushing the stroller at the same time. You know, have you seen a mom pushing a stroller with a cigarette? <clears throat> anyway, this, cigarettes are crazy. I mean, pretty much takes over. I don't know if this is just regulating flavored tobacco products, pro projects, flavored tobacco projects to prohibit the sale of flavored tobacco projects? Is that a typo or is that? I think it should be products. Products, oh, <clears throat> excuse me, okay. Products. Products, okay, that's a typo. Um, to me, a flavored tobacco product would be chew or dip. I mean, it's a tobacco product and if it's flavored like cherry or something, it's a flavored tobacco product. I think that would be included. Liquid, if it's liquid, you know, that liquid stuff, I guess, they sell, you know, at anywhere, I guess. That should be included because if that's, there's, you know, tobacco in there, it should be included. I don't know exactly. I mean, I've, I'm seeing, I don't smoke cigarettes, but I, I heard you could pinch one or something and it changes flavor, you know. It's terrible. I mean, people think that stuff is really cool. 
It's not. Anyway, um, at least to me, it's not. I, I really think there's a lot of respectful cigarette smokers. Um, I ask them politely to not smoke around me. And um, there's a lot of them that are really respectful. And I appreciate them. It makes the biggest difference in the world. Um, so there are a lot of respectful smokers that do know that the smoke bothers other people. They do know that it's harmful. So thank you very much for your time. Thank you. Good evening. My name is Paul Cummings, and I live at 923 Hillside. Um, I've been an Albany resident for 13 years and a proud parent of a third grader at Cornell. And um, thank you so much for, for looking at the issue of flavored tobacco. Um, flavored tobacco is an entry product for, for young people to get hooked on nicotine. Uh, nicotine is a dangerous drug. It's not harm free. Um, and I think it's really important that, that we look at this. I would also ask that um, we consider minimum pack size and um, minimum price. So earlier today, I um, went to a couple stores in Albany and uh, was able to purchase a couple products. So um, this one was out the door, a uh, $1.50. So it's three little cigars. Um, they're unflavored. This one was $1.42 out the door and um, two cigars, unflavored. So um, unfortunately, because of Juul and all the other products, we have a lot of young people that are addicted to nicotine and having very inexpensive products around, whether they're flavored or not, are going to be attractive to them and um, whatever we can do to protect them. Um, ideally by doing a comprehensive ordinance that addresses flavors, minimum pack size, um, and minimum price would be wonderful. So um, thank you very much for, for all your work for the city of Albany. Thank you, Mr. Cummings. Um, after Liz William will be Lamary Rodriguez, Owen Weispier, and Lisa Schneider. Thank you. Good evening, Mayor and City Council members. My name is Liz Williams. I'm with Americans for Non-Smokers Rights. We're a nonprofit just down the street on San Pablo in Berkeley. So on behalf of our members here in Albany, I want to encourage you to support this proposed ordinance to end the sale of flavored tobacco products. Not only does it include the flavored vaping products, it does also include uh, menthol cigarettes. And all of these flavored products are targeted by the tobacco and vaping companies directly at our youth and young adults, but also at um, LB the LGBT community and African Americans and low income communities. So really a wide swath of people who are specifically targeted with the marketing. And this proposal, really what it would do is to reduce the access to these flavored tobacco products that are enticing our young people to become addicted to not just tobacco smoking, but nicotine addiction as a whole. And the flavors really are what the, the key to that nicotine addiction. It makes it easier for people to start smoking, helps encourage people to continue smoking, and it makes it easier to inhale the nicotine. A lot of times we hear that from um, vaping companies and vape shops that they are not the tobacco industry, but Juul, which is the best-selling brand in the whole country, they recently spent nearly $13 billion to buy, or Philip Morris spent nearly $13 billion to buy a 35% stake in Juul. So the tobacco companies and tobacco industry and the vaping industry now are one and the same, and they are working in concert to protect our youth. So I encourage you to support this ordinance. It's something that many communities, both here in the Bay Area and around the country, are looking to do. And I want to thank you for your consideration and leadership. Thanks. Thank you, Ms. Williams. Next speaker, please. Good evening, Council. My name is Limayri Rodriguez, and I am speaking tonight as an Albany resident. Um, I'm here to voice my support for a provision that restricts the sale of menthol cigarettes and other flavored tobacco products. Um, it's no coincidence that four out of five kids who have used tobacco started with a flavored product. Science indicates that the brain's peak for developing addiction starts in adolescence, and the tobacco industry knows this. According to the Federal Trade Commission report, the tobacco 
industry spends around $1 million per hour, over 95% of its total marketing budget, just to push tobacco products at the point of sale in convenience stores, knowing that almost half of teenagers visit a convenience store once a week, and that teens are more likely to be influenced to use tobacco products by tobacco marketing than by peer pressure. It's disturbing to see that the industry aims to make such products easily accessible to youth and distort their perceptions by making tobacco products seem popular and acceptable. As a resident of this city, I'd also like to mention that I see tobacco advertisements of menthol cigarettes and other flavored tobacco almost every day on my way to work. Um, it crosses my mind how often teens in the city notice them and are influenced by them. Uh, so regulation of tobacco sales is definitely necessary in the city. I look forward to seeing your leadership and keeping the youth of the city safe from an industry that's determined to harm them. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Rodriguez. Next speaker, please. Uh, hi there. Um, my name is Owen Wise Pirick. Uh, I work for a local nonprofit organization called Bay Area Community Resources. Um, I'd like to point out that it's an obvious fact that high school students are vaping. Um, according to data collected by the Albany School District, um, a third of district 11th graders um, admit to vaping and two thirds of students in this district think that vaping products are easy to get. Um, we're here because we want to protect youth from the tobacco industry. So not only do these tobacco products um, contain dangerous chemicals like formaldehyde, lead, nicotine, among other chemicals, um, they're also a gateway to cigarette use. Um, multiple recent studies suggest that vape products um, are more likely to cause teens to start smoking cigarettes than they are to cause adult smokers to quit. Um, to make matters worse, the line between big tobacco companies and companies that produce vaping products is growing thinner every day. Um, a traditional tobacco corporation is the majority shareholder in every, every major company that produces vaping products. Um, to make no mistake, they've got a vested interest in keeping our kids hooked on their products. These companies are one in the same. They're not different. Um, so we shouldn't be fooled. Uh, the vape industry is nothing more than big tobacco in a fancy new costume. Um, and they're coming for our kids. So um, I guess the, the, at the end of the day, the question is, are we going to side with these companies that are pushing products, um, tobacco products that are you know, made to look like Sour Patch Kids, gummy bears, products with names like unicorn poop? Are we going to side with them, or are we going to side with our kids and families? Um, and that's the question tonight. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Weisbeard. Next speaker, please. After Lisa Schneider will be Brian Davis, Blythe Young, and Dr. Philip Gardner. Hello, I'm Lisa Schneider. I'm an Albany resident, and I encourage you to adopt an ordinance that will really be effective at discouraging tobacco addiction among young people and vulnerable populations. And um, it, um, if you believe that um, minimum packaging and cost measures would be effective but are somehow beyond the scope of what you're looking at currently, I would encourage you to take that up as soon as possible. It would make sense to me to do it all as, at once, but you may have your reasons for considering that separately. Thank you. Thank you. Next speaker. Good evening, my name is Brian Davis and I'm a member of the Alameda County Tobacco Control Coalition. First, I want to quickly respond to the adult store option. Um, over 30% of adult-only tobacco stores and vape shops statewide sold to 18, 19-year-old decoys last year. Last year, an exemption for them weakens policies to prevent illegal sales for people under 21. Allowing adult-only stores to continue selling flavored tobacco products gives those stores an unfair advantage over other retailers. 17 of the last 18 uh, California counties and cities that voted to restrict the sale of flavored tobacco products did not exempt adult-only stores. That shows California communities know that kids are getting flavored tobacco products at adult-only stores too. 
uh, a 2015 survey of over 40,000 middle and high school students nationwide showed that their overall tobacco use rate was 11.2%, but only 6.7% was from cigarettes. The rest in those pre-jewel days was from cigars, especially cigarillos, flavored and unflavored, which can easily be found for as little as six for 99 cents and are often used as a tobacco wrap for smoking marijuana, AKA blunts. Blunts expose youth to both nicotine and THC, increasing the risk that both chemicals will be part of young people's lives. Over 100 studies have shown that increasing the cost of tobacco products reduces smoking among underage youth and young adults. Early attempts to address this problem focused on minimum pack sizes of five for cigars in the hope that this approach would drive up prices. Hayward and Union City used this approach. The result was that products like these sold for five or six or 99 cents or a dollar became readily available in those cities. Learning from that experience, San Leandro and the city of Albany, excuse me, of Alameda, you're in the city of Albany, have chosen to adopt minimum price policies for cigars paired with a minimum pack size requirement. The minimum price in San Leandro is $7, and in Alameda it's $5 for packs of five cigars. These significant price increases make it less likely that underage youth will choose to experiment and perhaps become addicted to these products. Please take this information into account as you consider your options tonight. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Davis. Next speaker. Good evening. My name is Blythe Young, and I'm here um, as the Community Advocacy Director for the American Heart Association. Um, I'm here to support the proposed policy um, that would include minimum pack and minimum price. Um, these policies reduce the access to products um, that are the tobacco industry's key strategy for targeting and addicting new smokers, particularly youth. Um, more than 80% of youth who ever use a tobacco product report that their first um, experience was with a flavored product. We know that the tobacco industry is actively and aggressively working to addict new young people, particularly those from communities of color with flavored tobacco products. They know that flavors like grape, mint, especially menthol, um, cotton candy, bubble gum, and gummy bears mask the harsh taste of tobacco um, and make it highly appealing to youth. In California, one in 10 young adults um, ages 18 to 24 currently use e-cigarettes, um, which serve as the vehicle for these flavored tobacco products. Um, E-cigarettes are defined and defended by their purpose for cessation for adults. Um, we also know that there are many other products for cessation on the market which have been FDA approved, um, such as patches or gum that aren't flavored like candy. Um, so in reality, these devices and their coordinating flavored nicotine products have addicted a whole new generation of users, creating an epidemic among young adults and teens. Due to the lack of approval by FDA, there's little regulation um, as to what ingredients go into these products and are being inhaled when these products are ingested via vaping. Many studies show that users of e-cigarettes are more likely to transition to traditional tobacco products, um, and cigarette smoking is the leading cause of preventable disease and death in the U.S., claiming nearly half a million lives per year. The best way to prevent tobacco-related illness and death is to prevent smoking from beginning in the first place. Um, so overall, the negative public health impacts of these products, known and not yet known, far outweigh any benefits from provincial assistance or potential assistance to adults who wish to quit smoking. So in your pursuit of a flavored tobacco ban, um, I urge you to include minimum pack and minimum price and explore that topic further. Um, and really, as others have mentioned, consider who is being marketed to, who is this affecting, and realize that it is just tobacco and a new costume. Thank you. Thank you. After Next speaker. After Dr. Gardner, it would be Rachel Gratz Lazarus and Sonia Herbert and Elaine. So good evening, and um, thank you for having us back. Um, we were in the study section in December, um, had this discussion with you. Um, if there's one thing that the city council could do that would improve the health of Albany residents, it is to restrict the sale of flavored tobacco products, whether it's e-juices, menthol cigarettes, or flavored little cigars. Um, let's look at it this way. We've been all talking about the jewel explosion over the last year or so. Um, it's really been a flavors explosion. We're talking somewhere in the neighborhood of over 15,000 unique flavors, which my colleagues have pointed out to you. At the center of this, and what 
I came to you about earlier is the question of the menthol flavor. Menthol not only masks the harsh taste of cigarette, it has an anesthetic effect. This anesthetic effect leads to or allows deeper inhalation. The deeper you inhale, the more toxins and nicotine you intake. The more you take in, the more addicted you become. We have data that shows it's harder to quit menthol cigarettes. I would encourage um, you to follow. I did have a chance to read the report um, that was produced. I co-sign it. I would encourage Albany to join with Richmond, San Francisco, Beverly Hills, San Pablo. You know, we have a nice fight going on in Sacramento City and the state right now um, to do this. Let me just lastly say on the, um, the subject of the smaller pack size or the larger pack size, this first took place in Boston and there was a big back and forth um, on the East Coast about this. But when we won that fight and they were able to bunch cigars into packs of 10s or 20s, the use of them went way, way down. Um, I know that isn't part of the report and I appreciate, I want us to focus on the menthol issue and flavors, but let's not lose sight of that. Having said that, um, let me just thank you guys again for doing this. Um, I know there's been a lot of talk about how this impacts at least my community, the African American community. Be appraised that the majority of women who smoke cigarettes smoke menthol. Folks from the LGBTQ community disproportionately smoke menthol. Native Hawaiians disproportionately smoke menthol. Filipinos disproportionately smoke menthol. They're targeted at the, the most vulnerable parts of our community. You have a chance to do something about it today. I want to encourage you to do that. And thank you again for having me. I'll answer any questions you have. Um, at another point. Thank you, Dr. Hardiman. Next speaker. Good evening, Council. My name is Rachel Gratz Lazarus, and I'm speaking tonight as a member of the Alameda County Tobacco Control Coalition. As a public health advocate and a parent, I am deeply concerned about the way the tobacco industry is targeting our youth and other vulnerable communities with flavored tobacco products. This is why the FDA banned the sale of flavored cigarettes in 2009. Menthol in particular is a social justice issue, as Dr. Gardner talked about, which has historically targeted youth and African American, Asian, Hispanic, and LGBTQ communities with specialized menthol marketing campaigns. Regarding price, when tobacco is cheap and pack sizes are small, tobacco products are more affordable for youth to buy. Tobacco companies are well aware of this fact as they spend millions of dollars each year to heavily promote and strategically price their products. Exposure to this marketing in the retail environment highly encourages initiation and tobacco use, especially among young people and other price sensitive groups. Establishing a minimum price and pack size for tobacco products and prohibiting the redemption of tobacco discounts and coupons are effective ways to reduce smoking and tobacco use. As, uh, Albany's proposed ordinance currently includes no minimum price or minimum pack size for cigars. So singles like these little cigars and two packs like these are currently available for sale in the city for cheaper than the cost of a candy bar. We've also seen the industry's response to low minimum pack size requirements. In cities that have set a minimum pack size of five little cigars, we've seen the industry drop prices to six for 99 cents like this pack of Splitterillos to offset and keep smokers addicted. This is why setting up a strong minimum price for tobacco products along with minimum pack size is even more powerful. Albany can follow in the footsteps of other local communities like Alameda, San Leandro, and Sonoma County who have taken a stand and set minimum pricing standards for tobacco products. Thank you for your commitment to ensure that all of Alameda's children get to have the long and healthy lives that they deserve. Thank you. Next speaker. Hi there again. My name is Sonia Herbert. I've been an Albany resident for about 20 years, and I'm a public health professional. And I want to say for all of the evidence that has been given by residents and public health professionals about the addictive quality and deceptive marketing practices to youth, I'll say what my Quaker parents would say, which is those friends broke my mind. I won't go over it again, and I'll save you some time for more speakers. I mentioned earlier my son Jasper and our walks home from school and what we see. And every day we pass the billboard that says, 
smoking one cigarette or tobacco product a day will shorten your lifetime by X years. And every day he asks me different questions. Well, why do people start? Well, why could they do that? Does tobacco taste as bad as it smells? And I described to him how the industry so effectively targets youth with flavoring um, in all of their products. So I want to say that today as I was leaving and had to leave Miss Bedtime, I said I was coming because exactly the question he asked me this afternoon was what the Albany City Council was proudly taking taking on tonight. So thank you so much for doing your part to keep our kids safe. Thank you. And one last thing on the price. I know it took my son seven years to save $10. So the data is there, but price and package sites matter. After Next speaker. After Elaine will be Gaurav Bali and Steve and Josette Wheaton. Mayor Nason, Vice Mayor McQuaid, City Council, this has got to stop. We cannot have our children hooked on cigarettes because as all the wonderful people have shown us, that it costs a dollar for a packet of cigarettes, how much is it gonna cost for cancer surgery? Or a funeral? That's what we need to think about. And the pain of the families that are gonna to have to bury their children because of cigarettes. And they're just going to be enticed. We can't have that. That can't happen in Albany. Cannot. Thank you. Thank you. No, no, no clapping, please. We, we listen to everyone and we don't, uh, we neither cheer nor razz any of our speakers. Thank you. Good evening, Council, concerned residents, community members. Uh, I represent Better Cloud, uh, a business in Albany that's a tobacco retailer. Um, I've heard many great arguments tonight regarding minimum pricing, um, access, influence, secondhand smoke. I can address some of those items. There's no problem from Better Cloud's position that impose a minimum price. There is no objection from Better Cloud to prohibit even the smoke of uh, even smoking within city limits. Uh, there is no objection uh, to Better Cloud for the city to impose some sort of a track and trace system similar to what cannabis has for state regulators to come in and verify that products are being sold in a legal way. Um, and for Better Cloud to take the initiative and impose a track and trace system so every product that comes out of its store, you will know, ends up in the right hands. There's no doubt there's going to be influence, but that's beyond the control of Better Cloud. And there's no doubt that the tobacco industry has created a perception from youth that this terrible act of youth being given a chance to smoke in any shape is bad. Better Cloud's position is that it runs a small business. Like any small business, it struggles to survive. And all we ask is if you look at three of the items that are set forth in the exemptions, adult only store, no entry. No entry to youth under 21 whatsoever at all. In combination with um, if you impose a rule that requires only businesses in operation from a certain date, you can't not have new retailers come in. So when Better Cloud is ready to go out of business because nobody in Albany wants to smoke anymore, it will go out of business. Um, or if it decides to leave, no one can replace it. Uh, and the third item, <coughs> buffer zones from sensitive locations, uh, would also prevent um, access and influence. Um, so our position is give the small business a chance uh, to continue what it's been doing for the past five years. It's been under the radar because it's done nothing wrong. It has a great history and reputability. 
Regarding the presence of better cloud, I'm not certain I understand the nexus by the mere purchase of a product from its retail store that would necessarily contribute to what the tobacco industry is doing. People have a right to do what they want. Some people like to kill themselves. That's just the way it is. Um, and any violation of one of the exceptions should be a total ban on that business running in your city. Thank you. Next speaker, please. Hello. Uh, my name is Steve. I'm a, I run Better Cloud. I'm the, the uh, owner operator of that store. We've been in business for uh, five and a half years now, and I got into this too. Uh, I used it to quit smoking myself, and you know, I had no idea this would it, it would become like this. The industry. Um, I'm, I take. I'm very serious about the youth getting their hands on this kind of product. I would never sell to to any other youth at all. My, my primary objective was to just help other people quit smoking, basically. I understand and I appreciate the, the concerns and, and the goals of the city. I, I, I understand it completely and uh, this means a lot to me and uh, I worked seven days straight for three years just building a, a business and just trying to do it uh, honestly. I mean, follow all the, the rules and the laws along with Nakhtan, my my girlfriend, we, we built it together. My dad's retiring soon. He put in a lot of work too to help me build counters and set up the shop. And I, I just want to take care of him in the future as well. Um, I'm terrified about how this might impact me, but, but I, I, I understand. And I'm willing to do whatever I got to do, contribute to the city's vision, advance it however you'd like. Um, uh, funding, if that's necessary, I can do as well. I mean, anything. Thank you for hearing me out. Thank you. Next speaker, please. Hello, everyone. I'm going to make this really quickly. My name is Josette Wheaton. I am the site coordinator for the Tobacco Use Prevention Education Program, which is based out of Alameda County of the Educational Building. Anyways, I'm also the campus supervisor for Albany High School. I've been there, I've been working for Albany Unified for 13 years. And part of what I do is I walk the exterior of the campus. I also go through the community, through the blocks, because I want to see if kids are there cutting, smoking, or whatever. Now, rewind back to 13 years ago, or even let's say five years ago, I was still catching students on those blocks, those residential blocks, smoking. Now that vaping has kicked in. I saw a neighbor the other day. He's like, hey, Josette, haven't seen you in a while. Where have you been? Well, I don't necessarily go in those neighborhoods anymore because they're all inside vaping in our bathrooms. Okay, And so I brought some of the students here so they can kind of quickly talk. But I just want to say everything that everyone had to say here, that. That's what I want to say. Like, we, we need to take this seriously, OK? It's not just high school students. It's middle school kids, sixth graders that are getting a hold of these vape pens and these flavored tobacco products. It's unacceptable. And I think it's a community that can get that job done. Here we go. Come on. Hi, um, I'm Shavaz. Uh, my name is Nico. My name is Sara. So we're here with the Tupi group, and we decided to keep it really short and sweet. So what we're going to do is we're going to read a few facts that we thought would speak for themselves. Um, vape, which is actually not vape because vapor is from water. Vapes actually produce aerosol, which contains many different chemicals like benzene and lead. Every four to five young tobacco users are initiated by flavored tobacco products. 20% um, of middle schoolers are drooling, which is one in five kids. And there are 15,000 plus tobacco flavors. Sales for e-cigarettes increased 641% during one year, from 2.2 million sold in 2016 to 16.2 million sold in 2017. 70% middle schoolers and high schoolers tobacco users have at least tried one tobacco flavored product. The best way to prevent tobacco related illness and death is to keep youth from starting to smoke in the first place, which starts with banning flavored tobacco products. Thank you very much. Actually, we're the ones who created this. I created that. We, we had a booth, and um, 
we wanted to write letters, and I figured the kids wouldn't have time to do letters, so I cropped it. I made this poster. We had a booth. Everyone signed it. I brought the box personally here to you. So thank you. We appreciate it. And we time. counted 514. Did I, do I have that right? 514. Thank you. Any other, uh, do we have any other speakers waiting? Has everyone had their, their say? Okay, then we'll bring it back to, uh, to the council for discussion. Thank Who you. wants to kick it off? Uh, okay. Well, there's, there's a couple of things to consider. One is we've gotten pretty far down the road for the ordinance we could approve tonight. I do think, you know, restricting the little flavored cigars is something we ought to do. Um, but the complication is what's going on in Sacramento right now because there's very similar bills in Sacramento. The one, that, the lead one that seems to be, to be targeting vaping is SB 38, Senate Bill 38. But there's many others and they're gonna be rapidly evolving in the next several weeks. So I'll just toss this out here. My suggestion is given kind of the mayhem up there and there's hundreds of bills they're considering, not all about vaping, mostly they're about housing, but is let's finish up what we started so it's done. And is then we can monitor what's going on in Sacramento simultaneously while we consider a new ordinance on flavored tobacco products because we may be completely preempted by whatever laws come down out of Sacramento. So I'm a little hesitant to start on a new project until we see whether or not the odds are we're gonna be, pre be preempted by the, the legislation that comes out of Sacramento. However, I don't want to sideline the work we've already done. I think we need to finish up what we did, get this vaping ordinance on the books, and then if, see what's go, going on in Sacramento and coordinate our efforts on any further bans on cigarellos while well, he's going to pay attention to what's going on at the state level. That would be my suggestion. Other perspectives? Um, that sounds good to me. Yeah, I agree with that. I think we should finish this ordinance, get it done. I wouldn't be opposed to putting a six months time within the next six months we come back with the other part of the ordinance and I know they've left but I do want to um, especially shout, call out to the high school students who came they were fabulous um, I think it's a bit of an echo chamber up here uh, this evening on this issue because it, this did come before us before and, and now it's here again I, I think whatever reservations we had about um, uh, immediately passing this last time uh, have, have pretty much gone up in smoke uh, as far as I can see the um, uh, you know my my uh, daughter in high school I had really no idea when this first came up to us that vaping had gotten so big in the high school and then I, I I happened to talk to my daughter who said, oh yeah, you can't walk into the bathrooms without vaping going on. Um, you know, in my heart of hearts, I hope Sacramento gets it together and passes something that's statewide that will apply to everything. Um, and I and I and it's looking like it's good, but you know the way legislation works up there, there'll be gives and takes, and and um, it may not be all that as perfect as we might want it. So I'm I'm happy to say let's go forward now on the legislation we have before us, um, and uh, perhaps. Uh, uh, you know, schedule as soon as possible looking at uh, minimum size, uh, minimum price, and, and those issues, which um, might be a harder pull up in Sacramento, and we would at least have that in motion. Um, and, uh, you know, if, if our Albany law is only effective for a short time, and then some kind of state legislation um, takes over and uh, becomes the kind of the defining thing for all of California. I, I'm okay with that too, just because I think it's great that Albany's taking a stand and going forward. 
I just want to say so far, the bills I've seen, the draft bills, don't preempt any existing or stronger local regulations. So ours might be in place and might be more strict than what the state passes, and that would be fine. Yeah. Or it may be that given the time that is written into our ordinance that the state could pass something that is equally strict uh, and uh, uh, render our ordinance not uh, unnecessary, but we have it as a backstop even if that were not to happen. Um, with respect to uh, the small package and minimum price uh, idea, is everyone comfortable with waiting to giving the process in Sacramento some time before directing the staff to start work on an ordinance to, uh, uh, to address that issue? I'd like to see us start looking at that sooner rather than later. With the way things going in Sacramento, we might have a clearer picture in three or four weeks. It, it won't be very long. Uh, I'd, that, I'd rather uh, wait. I'd rather acceptable. give it yeah. time. Yeah, I think I would as well. Okay, okay I think um, it sounds like we do have a consensus and are ready for a motion. I'll move to council introduce for first reading ordinance 2019-04, approving amendments to section 5-24 tobacco retailer license of the Albany Municipal Code to prohibit the sale of flavored tobacco products. I'll second that. Council, Council Member Barnes? Yes. Council Member Moss? Yes. Council Member Pelch? Yes. Vice Mayor McQuay? Yes. Mayor Nason? Yes. And the motion carries. Great. Okay. So we move on to unfinished business, beginning with the City Council Strategic Plan update. May we have a staff report, please? Thank you, Mayor. Uh, in January, the Council reviewed their strategic plan. Starting on January 7th, you held a work session um, where you reviewed implementation status as well as uh, began to look at items to update in the existing strategic plan document. Uh, staff returned to you for a study session on January 22nd. Uh, to further identify updates to the strategic plan. Since that time, uh, staff has worked on the uh, feedback received from the council and in close uh, coordination with the mayor and vice mayor to develop a strategic plan that responds to the interests of the council and to the community in terms of the feedback you've heard to date. Um, you'll see that there's a different format proposed, and that's up on the screen here, and we're happy to walk through that with the mayor. Um, the information that you had in the previous table version is included in this document. It may be in different words, and we can certainly look at how, how things are defined and how they're represented uh, to make sure that it fits the needs of the council and, again, the community interests. Um, at this point in time, we would like the council to take a look at the document and walk through it with the mayor, uh, receive any public comment, and then give direction to staff in terms of interest in adoption or any other changes you'd like to see. I hope everyone had a chance to take a, a look. It's, I know it looks very different because of the difference in format. It actually should as you go through it in substance, I think you'll find that it's, uh, uh, the substance is nowhere near as different as the format is. And I'd like to particularly thank um, City Manager Almaguer and uh, Sid Schoenfeld um, uh, for their efforts to make this a more user-friendly document. It's something I'd like to uh, approach in the future with our financial documents, just making things a little easier uh, to read and absorb. Um, I don't think, we, we <coughs> did go through, when it was in the Excel format, we went through uh, line by line. I don't think it's necessary uh, to do that tonight. We'd need 
um, quite a bit of time when it really has not changed uh, as much as all that. Um, I would suggest we page through for just a few highlights and then um, uh, go into questions. Some of the highlights, I think one, well, I don't know if it's a highlight or a low light, but we did not, as you'll see, the, the mission statement, including the, the maintenance of our small town ambiance, uh, is still as it was, although I think that there was a consensus that that's something we want to take up as we continue to discuss um, our city's future in terms of its transportation and housing, uh, what we choose and what we what may be beyond our choice as the the state uh, takes action on those issues, and um, and we need a municipal response. So it's something that uh, that mission statement is as it is, but is something that we I think we can all expect we'll need to come back to. Um, there have been a few places where. There are things that were suggested um, and seemed like great ideas, but part of what we're doing here is prioritizing um, items that uh, are worthy. So you will see things that are potential work plan additions, and um, these are items that we're suggesting are worthy of the work plan, and we should come back to them and potentially include them in the work plan um, as, uh, as time and resources allow, but not allow them to be dropped off of our radar screen. We wanted to make this as, uh, as comprehensive and inclusive as possible without uh, putting an impossible load on the staff. We're shooting for an ambitious but realistic plan that the staff can take up and uh, uh, really get done during the period uh, allowed. And are there questions? Yes. Yeah, I'm all in favor of um, a realistic uh, set of items for staff to work on. That said, um, I'm not sure that we can just so quickly go through this due to the very different format that we have in front of us now and due to the fact, uh, just as you mentioned, that the, some items were pulled out into potential additions uh, that were not uh, pulled out before. So a prioritization has been done here that we've only seen, we've only started, we will only be able to address tonight. So uh, although I don't, I certainly don't think we have to go over every item, I think we will have to go through every section and uh, 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 I'll ask for any comment from uh, council members and the public. How do you, others feel about that? You, you know, the, the one comment I would I would make is, it's I'm I think it's a great format. It's a little clearer in many ways, but it also seems to have um, more minimized. Well, some of the things that were in our previous strategic plans were you know timing, budget. Um, you know, where this came from and staff. I mean, there's information that didn't end up in this. And, and to some degree, that information, I, I think, was, you know, useful. Um, I agree with that. And um, it, you mean the, the status or the, uh, the, the comments and staffing, uh, the, these, um, this was only prepared to go down through the level of these first three columns in the old right uh, they don't ha we don't have the timing budget advisory body some of them have some items are kind of indicated which advisory body might take it on um, but we don't have these additional comments yet but the idea would be that as the staff takes it back and develops the work plan and budget that we would we would again have those Okay. Uh, well, I mean, I, I, I would funding. be okay with that, but it, it does it it does seem to me it's a bit incomplete in 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 this current form. And and if this is something information that's going to come, you know, soon after, then um, you know that's a different situation. But that wasn't as clear to me when I first looked at this. 
Yeah, that, that I think we were envisioning would, the, the timing, implementation timing and budget would be part of the staff uh, budget planning. Though, you know, it could, there's no reason it couldn't be inserted into this document in this format if people think that that is useful. But, um, well, this, this certainly has nice photographs in it that the other one didn't have. I think the, uh, the main idea was to have something that's a little easier, uh, easier to comprehend uh, so that items that kind of belong together on a page are on that page. So we have all of our goals and objectives actually fit rather nicely on a single page, on page three. And that can give you a good Overall, it gives uh, the person who is not familiar with the work of the city council kind of an easy way to look at one page and see the overall plan for the city. What are, what are we trying? What are we up here for? What are we trying to achieve? And that's uh, that's pretty comprehensible, I think. Yeah, I think and the then you go Sorry. to the individual objectives and the work plan items to make those object to to achieve those objectives. Yeah, the readability is certainly improved, but we I think we do must we should recognize that we have lost the information uh, that was more comprehensive in the previous format. And you mean the the timing and budget? Yeah, uh, timing budget yes. advisory body comments, yep. current status, recommended update, etc. If I may add yes. a bit of detail I would envision the document that you're reviewing on the screen tonight as layer one. It's your strategic plan. It's your story of what you're intending to achieve over the time period. The time period as expressed on the document is July through June of 2021. Uh, as you receive implementation status updates, you will have that level of detail in terms of the status and any recommended updates or any comments that are necessary. Um, the the spreadsheet that we had before, for better or worse, was really a, a scratch pad, if you will, for uh, staff to identify who's doing what, how and when, and what uh, funding do we have available for that. So I think there's several layers to the strategic plan. Yeah, and I think that the staff would need to come back with us, come back to us with budget, um, budget and timing. The advisory body piece is probably kind of an iterative process as we're going through uh, the work plans and we're providing guidance to the advisory bodies about what we would like to see them work on and they're coming to us saying what they think that they ought to be working on and trying to kind of reconcile, bring those two different visions together into something that fits into the strategic plan um, that, but that also takes into account what they are, are calling for. And as part of the, the council's policy regarding advisory bodies, those work plans are to encompass the city council strategic plan and you will see that incorporated as those are presented to you as soon as your next meeting. Well, would the pleasure of the council be to come? I'm, I'm reluctant uh, to try to do this on a line-by-line -line basis, although if people feel strongly about doing that right now, um, I don't, uh, we, can, we can begin that process. Um, my inclination would be uh, to address specific questions that people have uh, and take public comment and um, if the desire is to work into the format of the work plan, uh, budget and timing and advisory body information, um, that would be something that we would, I think, would bring back in conjunction with, uh, with the budget. 
but it would be, I think it would be healthy for the work plan process and as guidance for staff if we could uh, uh, at least tentatively approve this as their framework for developing the budget. Yeah, I mean, I, it, it is sort of the basic list it, it, as far as I could see, although I, I must say it, it is, you know, I'd finally gotten used to this, and, <laughs> and now, I, now I have something different to look at. And I never, never did get used to that. You know, if there's something, if there is a theme to this in terms of substance, I would say it's a little bit, uh, the, the theme would be sort of back to basics that we know we've got challenges with our financial reporting and everything that revolves around that. And there is, it makes it a big priority to get that done. And that's something that will drop out of strategic planning when we're, we've got it all dialed in. It won't even need to be part of the strategic plan. But right now, that's a focus. Another is paving the streets. Our PCI has deteriorated, uh, we've got basic infrastructure uh, as, a, as a priority here as well. And I think that the rest of it is, uh, you know, there are a few things like the youth summit that, uh, that uh, Council Member Moss and Vice Mayor McQuaid are going to work on, there are f and there are things that are carried forward from the previous plan, but those sort of, uh, uh, really basic municipal things that uh, uh, that clearly need some some more more focus are probably the biggest substantive difference between this plan and the, the previous uh, one. I mean, I, I think that it's just uh, I don't think we should. I, I I don't disagree with any of that. I just don't think we should say, oh hey, here's a very new format. Uh, very different from the old format, and just leave it at that. I think we should we should call out what's uh, how it's changed and maybe what's missing. And maybe I would even suggest that if staff still wants to maintain something like this, that would be great. Uh, and if this is our working document, that's great as well. But um, I, 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 I'm not going to I don't I'm not going to push anything specifically. I just want to point out that that it's it's a it's a big change to format. That's all. Okay, well, would you like to maybe work through a couple of items and say, you know, see where the, where changes have been made and we can check back and say, well, do we want to continue going through it line by line? Well, I, I did, I mean, yeah, I, there probably won't be too much for me to comment on, but I assumed that we wanted to take public comment before we came, we brought this back to, uh, for changes or any suggested changes, but okay, whatever, okay. the mayor's pleasure. Well, let me jump in here for a minute. Sure. I'm, I think I've, I think I have a little more experience with this simply because we kind of worked on it a little bit longer. So it, it's pretty clear to me, but I'm trying to figure out how to make it more clear. Um, and the grid form, I think, is, is a good backup document. And I'm, I'm trying to figure out how that, when we do budget, if, we, if that could be, and I think this is what you've said, could that be part of the budget process or is that? It's too complicated. I need to think that through a little bit more, and I, I certainly understand the interest, um, and I need to think about how that's formatted, how it fits into the budget. You're, you're going to have a lovely budget document. I'm really excited to present to you that has budget narratives, and it, it will certainly address and um, embody what's in the strategic plan, so I'll, I'll need to think through what the format is a little so bit. So perhaps with a different budget form, we really don't need to redo this? I, th I don't think so. And okay. I think that when you receive implementation updates, which are a requirement that mm -hmm. the staff provide to you, you will have some format, a hybrid of these that I, I still need to envision a little bit more that catches the things that I'm hearing that you want to see. Um, but again, it, it's going to take a little thinking. Shall we take public comment and then come back to uh the specifics? Okay. Do we have comment cards? Yes. Nick Peterson? Yeah. 
Hi, Nick Peterson, resident. I'm also here as a member and representing um, Albany, Climate Action, Albany Climate Action Coalition. So first of all, I want to commend you on uh, putting uh, action on uh, climate change front and center. And I don't know if this little circular um, diagram means that this is our primary focus. It seems to start there and come all back, but a healthy and sustainable urban village so sustainable is really what I want to talk about. Um, I, I support entirely that uh, we proceed with our update of our climate action plan, but it's become really apparent to me in keeping my ear to the ground about this, the science and what's going on. I think we all have heard of the recent UN science reports and even our federal institutions, which the president couldn't even block, saying that we are really in a, 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 a crisis as far as the environment goes. So things are pretty urgent. And what I want to emphasize here is I think we need to do more than just develop the plan. We need to have some actions actually happening. And I commend staff for they're really working hard. They're trying to get it through. They have a lot on their plate. It's, it's moving along. But one thing that's become really evident, and this builds on what you guys have already done with, with making Albany 100% carbon free with East Bay Community Energy. So we got to get more onto that electrical, that good sustainable electricity. So uh, unfortunately, probably 30% uh, of our emissions are still based on gas-fueled uh, appliances and homes and businesses. And then there's a huge chunk that's also gas-powered cars. And those are sort of tied together in how we, we approach that. So I think putting an emphasis on moving away from fossil fuel in heating, water, and homes uh, heating space and homes should be front and center. It's, you know, you, you read all the information that's coming out. Every city is focused on electrification. It's the big thing now. And we've put our eggs kind of in that basket, you know, with East Bay Community Energy, but uh, it's been proven with a community after community that that is the only way that we're going to reduce our emissions. So what I encourage you to do is take this um, potential work plan additions, which is an electric appliance requirement, and maybe phrase it more in, in um, elimination of uh, fossil fuel um, burning uh, measures for uh, use in buildings. There's a good opportunity to do this now, too, because the new codes are rolling out. You know, they go on this three-year cycle. In 2020, we're going to be uh, adopting the new building code, which does have some good measures, but they don't completely eliminate um, fossil fuel. So if we could, we could do that, I'd appreciate it. You just received a, a letter from the Northern California, uh, Northern Bay Area chapter of the Sierra Club supporting this also. So thank, thank you very you. much. Good evening, council, staff. Uh, my name is Ian McLeod. I'm on the Planning and Zoning Commission, but I'm here on my own behalf. And I agree 100% with uh, previous comments about the climate crisis, et cetera. Uh, and I'd also like to speak in support of a natural gas ban on new construction using natural gas and new construction. Natural gas is not really natural gas, it's methane. It's one of the worst greenhouse gases out there. Uh, it's inherently unstable. Gas meters leak, pipelines leak. It's a huge, huge greenhouse gas. The way forward, is to eliminate it in our new construction and then eventually work backwards to eliminate it in current buildings. It's basically a pollution source. It's a point source pollution in our buildings. The way forward is to go all electric. I am a, an architect and builder. I've been designing and building all electric houses for several years now. It is really the way to achieve net zero. So you go all electric solar panels on the roof, solar electric panels, and what's eventually coming is battery backup. Battery backup is going to be the next big thing in building. You dampen the curves, provide a steady power source through the evening, through the nighttime, and you can get to net zero. And the, the way forward is to eliminate natural gas. I'm 100% convinced of that. And I think that should be a major part of the climate action plan, and that should be something that uh, is worked on by whatever advisory board takes that over. I think it's the Climate Action Committee. Um, you know, City of Berkeley has an ordinance, a draft ordinance on the books for organic, uh, banning gas appliances, and I think we should follow their lead. It would be great to get this done 
for the new code adoption, uh, which is soon, it's uh, January 2020, the 2019 building code will be adopted, which basically makes uh, all new buildings in California go net zero. So you're going to be required to put renewable energy on the roof. And in conjunction with that, if we can uh, get people off natural gas, that's the way forward, I think, the best way forward. Um, I don't know how much time I have. Um, just a couple other small items. Um, I think with the um, disaster preparedness and resiliency, I think part of uh, disaster preparedness should be some sort of plan for a major fire in the Berkeley Hills. Um, up until a few years ago, I wouldn't have really imagined that a fire could sweep down the hills and come to Albany. But given the recent fires in California, the jump freeways, um, et cetera, I think Albany should have some kind of uh, plan for that. So thank you very much. Thank you. Okay, bringing it back to council, I'd like to point out we did, a, we did go through this line by line, and the two items that were in what we went through line by line are the two items under work plan items. We added the potential work plan additions because these were specific measures that people had, um, through the public input process, uh, people had brought forward. And so we wanted to be able to say to people, we're not dropping any of this. We're doing, you know, these are things that are, are worthy. They will be considered um, by the Climate Action Committee, however, before they are to be considered by council. And that would probably, I, I don't think that's really any different than what we approved. It's just a little, calls these things out a little bit more specifically. Um, and in any case, they will be, I think that we would want them to be considered by the Climate Action Committee because it's really squarely in their purview. Um, and they're, so they're the ones to take a, a close look at it. I think they'd actually probably be unhappy if we said, well, we're not gonna, gonna talk to, the, you know, we're not gonna send that to the Climate Action uh, Committee. I, so. I, I don't think it's substantively what is being advocated is different from what we have here. It's just that we are meant now, this version mentions an electric appliance uh, requirement. It mentions two-stroke engines, and it mentions um, potential changes to the EBCE defaults as things to be potentially examined in connection with the Climate Action Plan, which is what we previously approved. Does that make sense? Uh, sure. Um, should I speak to that now? Or, sure. Um, yeah, sure. So, uh, yeah, I think the reason this is being called out, and by the way, uh, I would suggest a um, maybe a changing of the language. Electric appliance requirement is a little bit of a strange wording. Usually it's called electrification or uh, reach codes also. Um, delve into this area, but maybe electrification would be a better term. Uh, what I've been told by the environmental advocates is the reason it's being called out is because the uh, it's such an important item. And I fully imagine that it's going to be in the Climate Action Plan and that, that the, it will be subsumed in there. Uh, but one of the things that was pointed out to me by one of the advocates is that um, we have opportunities right now to work on this in the, in the Climate Action Committee. Am I, is, am I giving it the right name? I yeah. can't remember anymore, Climate Action Committee. Yeah. Um, and also Berkeley is proceeding very rapidly with code changes in this area. So this would just give them um, a basis on which to work on that now, knowing full well it will also be in the, in the Climate Action Plan. I think that's just the, the reason this is called out here. Um, and so I would be in favor of moving it um, into a work plan item. I don't quite understand what you said about it, us preempting the Climate Action Committee. I think this, the idea this, here is, is that it would go, back, it would, we're yeah. giving this to the Climate Action Committee. Yeah, and that's, that's the intent, yeah. that's what this does. Yeah, so I, 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 for that one, I would just be in favor of using the word electrification and moving it to, to work plan items because it has become 
uh, because there are so many advocates out there uh, pulling for this and wanting to work on it and because it is such an important issue of our, of our day. Do you want to keep the two-stroke engines and cha potential changes to EBCE defaults? Um, I didn't really want to wordsmith it now here. The only, uh, I would just maybe insert the word electrification after uh, specific, me specific measures such as and leave the rest the same. Uh, but if, if you wanted to do something different, I'm open to that too. Okay, let's do that. Specific measures such as electrification, comma, a prohibition. Because we could also put it in number one. We could say develop new climate action plan, including electrification measures in 2019, and then take it out of that potential work plan additions and say specific additional measures such as a prohibition on two-stroke engines. Does that, uh, is one way better than another? I'm not I sure. I'd be open to either, I think. That makes think sense. I think it would make, uh, probably make the advocates happy to see it moved up into number one. Yeah, well, that's, yeah, up so into the work plan items, including, yeah. Including, including new climate action plan, including electrification measures. Do you want it to say including consideration of or including? Um, including consideration. You know, why don't we just say including electrification measures because there's no question that some kind of electrification is going to be part of the climate action plan. It's, yeah. uh, and then under potential workplace additions, we just say uh, specific additional measures, since we do have one measure mentioned, such as a prohibition on two-stroke engines and potential changes to EBCE defaults. Maybe instead of saying referred, we just say to be, cons to be, uh, how about just potentially considered in the cap. Okay. The fewer words, the better. Sure. Yeah, I'm good uh, with page four. <clears throat> I had a point for, um, to, to, uh, a suggested point we could add in under objective two, which is to consider, um, oh, now I am going to have to wordsmith, consider the, uh, uh, con consider a short-term rental Consider some consider a short-term rental ordinance, uh, uh, meaning Airbnb, what's that? Airbnb, that kind of yeah, thing. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Uh, meaning either more enforcement of business licenses or what other cities have done, which is to say, you you can't you can only have so many short-term units in the city because they're taking away long-term housing. It isn't that. Um covered to some degree under usage of accessory units. That was the intention. Where was that? that? That's, that's uh, number four. Compile a list and annually monitor number size and usage of accessory dwelling units. I, when I read that, I thought that sort of covered the uh, use of, uh, of these units. That was oh, the four. idea. Oh, and if we discover that they are uh, this is objective two, mm, work plan see. item four. Okay. The idea is if we do have too many of them being used, if we think that we need the, the residential units more than we need uh, tourist accommodation units, uh, that we could potentially consider some kind of ordinance. And if we're, and very important to know that we are in fact collecting a, a TAU yeah. uh, tax on 
uh, on units that are being used in that way. Yeah. So it, I think it is covered there. So I read that. Uh, I don't think it quite is. I read that as uh, keeping track of the ADUs, which is great. But um, short-term rentals include um, rooms in houses, full houses, as well as ADUs. So I don't think it's quite the same thing. I'd rather call out. Uh, con I'd rather have an item that was consider uh, consider. Yeah. A, 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 what did I say? Now I can't even remember. Consider a short-term rental ordinance, something very, something very vague, which we can just come back to. Well, if you if you just added after dwell, uh, accessory dwelling units, uh, homes in general, or you know. Well, it's short-term rentals. That's the key. Yeah. Is and so that's not mentioned. Somehow working in short-term rentals. How about if we just were to add and it says and usage of accessory dwelling units and short-term uh, and, and short rentals generally. Sure, well that could say compile list and annually monitor, um, doesn't, doesn't call for would, any action. That would give us the sense of whether, I think we need the information before we need to decide if we have a problem we need to address. Um, it, that would be fine for now, I guess. Well, another way to think about it is to move it all the way to um, facilitate government accountability where we talk about re uh, revenue sources. Uh, I'm sorry. I'm fading fast. I'm going home. I'm sorry. And tucking it in there, uh, um, objective three in the very back. You're under... Okay. One more page. Uh-huh. Uh, certainly, is it's related to revenue, we could put it there, but it's more about the, the housing stock. That's why right. I thought that housing availability was the right place for it. Right. Yeah. You know, in a perfect world, when we look at all of the things we want um, uh, landlords to do, which includes electrification. You know, electrification is not just an issue of new construction. It's also looking for ways to incentivize landlords who currently have aged, you know, old, out-of-date appliances uh, to, to upgrade. You know, there's all these different things that we want landlords to do. In a perfect world, if we had a, a permitting system where people pull a permit, and we're able to give them clear guidance about what the city expects from them. I think we'd have less, less friction. We'd have more, a little more revenue and a little less friction. Uh, but for now, I think just being sure that we gather that information is probably the first step to know what our pro what problems we have to be addressed. Uh, and, and I would I would agree with that, and in part because um, you know one of the considerations. Uh, uh, if, if we're going to require all homes to be electrified, I, one of the things I, I, I would, I personally wouldn't, don't want to see is that we're going to make it more expensive for people, uh, particularly for low-income people. So I think um, we have to, yes, we should electrify, we should get out of, uh, out of uh, uh, fossil fuels, but I think we also have to keep that other kind of thing in mind, too, is that we don't make Albany a particularly expensive place, particularly for low-income uh, families who um, might be hit by a, even a small change in a monthly bill that's more electric. And I'm not saying that's necessarily going to happen, but I, but I think we have to take that other little factor. So perhaps at this point, if, if we're just in that monitoring mode, uh, to kind of gather information, and then we can factor all into as to how we want to proceed from well, that. Well, it, addressing the electrification, that was a, kind of a different item and not really related to this, but the electric, electrification that people are pushing is on new construction, where it's shown to be right. cost-effective or cheaper than, than having and, gas. And it, is, and it is cheaper if you, if you just wire a building. But, but for the people living there, if they're going to have to pay the utility bills. No, no, no. Ongoing costs they've shown to be uh, equivalent okay, as well. Okay. Yeah. Well, if that's so, the case, then yeah. fine. Um, but, but about the short-term rentals, just, just to give people an idea, I did an informal uh, survey of Airbnb, just Airbnb units. I didn't check HomeAway slash VRBO, but there are about 100 units in Albany. Wow. 
Wow. And I'm guessing that they're not all licensed, but that's 100 units that are taken out of the long-term housing stock. So that's, that's the issue. That's the issue that has been addressed in cities like San Francisco and others, um, where you take, you're taking these things out of housing stock. I'm, I'm, I'm fine with how we've boarded it here, but I just want people to understand the issue. So mm -hmm. we would add the phrase at the end of work plan item four, it says usage of accessory dwelling units and of other types of units or rooms used for short-term occupancy. Does that? Uh, Sounds clear? fine, okay. thank you. Any other? Uh, areas of specific concern? Well, I'm very interested in the parking permit stuff, but I think that's fine where, it's, where it is. I think that's something that will, it will either drop down or rise up as you know, other events develop with economic development, so. Yes, yes, I think that's right. Uh, on page six, um, sorry. Um, I wasn't planning to, but. So you should uh, tell him that so he knows. <laughs> if you would, uh, you know, um, I, I probably, yeah, I think we have to be done with public comment. Um, if you have something specific and brief, it's, it's okay. Let us, let us know. Um, sorry, I didn't want to push it too hard, but anyway, just to, with w the suggestion and response to just say develop new climate action plan in 2019. Oh, no, we don't want to go back to that. We, we did that. Are you, I, right, but, uh, but it's still in the, but, it's still a planning. What I want to say, what I think is important for the city to move on is um, develop or have an item separate from just the climate action plan is planning, right? No, no, the climate action plan is something that we adopt and, and take action on. It will have action. It absolutely is. Right. So if we wanted to get action on electrification sooner, would it be a take action on methods for uh, electrification? It's in 2019, and you said that the important thing was to have it done before January 2020, right? That means as an actual part of code requirements, that it becomes yeah. law. So if it's just in the planning process, I guess that's what I'm worried yeah. about. I didn't want to get it locked into don't, just part don't, of being. Don't be worried about that. It is, you know, the, the people to to talk to are the Climate Action Committee. Yeah, Aren't I, you on the Climate yeah, Action I am Committee? On the, <laughs> okay. You, you guys I'm not speaking. get it done, okay? Yeah. Well, we we're, will, look, so. we're looking at you. I think it's a little bit We'll probably here. come back to you as soon as possible with a request to do an ordinance on removing Excellent. natural gas. The sooner, the sooner you Perfect. bring okay, us a recommendation, the, how, the happier mm -hmm. we'll be. Thank you. Thank you very much. All right. Uh, page six, um, I just, uh, I guess it doesn't, it doesn't need to move, but the, the marijuana thing, uh, uh, for one thing, I, I think this can't be a potential work plan addition because we said we would do it. We said we would review the ordinance, so I think that has to be a work plan item. I think that has to be number five. Okay, um, no problem. And, uh, number, um, and, and then, I has, uh, then, I, then I was thinking that maybe this should be moved to economic development, but then I remembered that um, there's a lot of data that, uh, that, peop that, that people are making more and more use of the medical marijuana, especially seniors these days. So under public health and safety, I think that's fine. Yeah, and there's also a lot of concern on the other end of the age spectrum uh, that there is more evidence about the effect of you know, the powerful marijuana that's available now on developing teenage brains, and we want to be mindful that of that Let, as well. Let's not micromanage this. And, yeah. But I will, I'm going to micromanage it. Maybe we change it to, <laughs> to um, <laughs> let's change let's, let, to, let's Vice mayor micromanage it, Exactly. Yes. Let's change it to cannabis. That seems to be the word in the state. Oh, yeah, that's a good idea. Very good. <clears throat> OK. To save you time, I don't have another comment until page 12, but okay. I don't want to rush us through. Do you have, are you seeing anything you've read? Um, no, I, you know, I, I looked at this twice and I didn't, it seemed like everything that I thought was in there was in there. Although, I think so. <coughs> so. Okay.
Okay. Uh, page 12, Nick. Yeah. So, um, <coughs> uh, under number three, objective one, number three, um, the mayor had mentioned addressing height limit, sorry, the vice mayor had mentioned addressing height limits, um, and I think it was either a member of staff or a member of the public who had uh, talked about reform of floor area ratio of FAR. Um, so I don't know if we wanted to include those specifically in here or not. Um, Personally, I'd rather leave that with planning and zoning. That that's fine. Uh, I, I there, you thought know, I'd give it a shot. Just uh, so wonky. Uh, but. Okay, and then uh, I think that's my last specific comment on an item, but. Um, I note that there's a number, there's a formation of a number of um, subcommittees in here, which is fine. Um, but I thought that if it's a strategic plan, that we wouldn't necessarily call out the members of the subcommittee. You know, um, that yeah, seemed a little strange. It is a little strange, but it was that was what happened when we were going through um, this one. One of the the ideas was uh, was creating a youth summit, and uh, some of us were a little concerned about using staff time for that. And the response was actually that it would be volunteer-led yeah. and volunteer-based. Uh, and so we have two volunteers here, so yeah. we include that, included that in it. Yeah, and I'm, um, I'm, not, and I'm, not, saying, does, I'm not saying that I, I care or object in any way to the composition of the subcommittees either. It's just yeah. that if it's a strategic it, it plan. It doesn't really belong in a strategic plan. Then you probably you. shouldn't call out the people, or you probably shouldn't call out the mayor and the vice mayor unless you mean it to be in perpetuity that that subcommittee would only be comprised of the mayor and vice mayor. If that's your meaning, then um, yeah, no, actually, I'm not a, sure why you do that. But No, there's yeah. a couple that are just ongoing. There's Alta Bates in the yeah. East Bay Regional Park District, and those were just continuing what we're doing. I yeah. can change those words if we don't want them in there, but I, I don't think it does any harm. I, I do agree with you. It doesn't really belong in a strategic plan, but I don't see it as doing any harm either. I just think I see potential for staff for staff later on or another council to look back at this and say, oh, what did they mean by that? Do they mean these people have to do it? Do they mean the mayor and the vice mayor have to do it? I'd prefer to, to, to remove those, but... Um, Sure, we can remove those. We'll, we'll rename it to a subcommittee of the city council. So we'll just change where we have, where we name subcommittee members, we'll remove that. Yeah. Well, are you okay with changing it to subcommittee of the city council? Yes. Yep. And uh, I also uh, mentioned to staff that we just probably just want to put these subcommittees on the website so that there's transparency about that. Good. And... Uh, Okay, see no objection to that. Um, do, 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 do. And that's it. All right. It wasn't too bad. Not too bad. Not too bad at all. And I think we come out with a better, a better project, uh, a better product as a result. So are we, um, are we motion? comfortable referring this to staff for next actions uh, as they're working on the budget mm -hmm. and timelines and such? So I would move uh, resolution 2019-24, approving the updated July 1st, 2019 uh, to June 30th, 2021, City Council Strategic Plan. I'll second that. Uh, we, that's with changes. With, with, the, with the changes the, that the changes uh, discussed council tonight. discussed. Okay. Council Member Moss? Yes. Council Member Pilch? Yes. Vice Mayor McQuaid? Yes. Mayor Nason? Yes. And then we go to number 10-2, Letter of Support for ACA 1. Um, this was on our last agenda. Uh, we had a summary of the, um, of the bill that said that it, uh, it, it that the, uh, the proposal applied to cities and counties. And Council Member Barnes raised the question whether it would apply to special districts. 
And the concern with this, uh, it, this has to do with putting on, uh, it, it, this is a request from the League of Cities. It has to do with um, putting onto ballots, um, uh, putting onto a California state ballot a reduction in the percentage uh, requirement for certain types of taxation uh, under Prop 13, reducing from the two thirds. Um, and Council Member Barnes was concerned about its application to special districts. It turned out he is correct, although the material that we had from the League of Cities indicated that it was only cities and counties. Uh, he and I went back and looked at the bill language and it did include special districts. And from his perspective, that made it something he did not want to support because of concerns about um, measures uh, that are proposed in a larger region in which the region is selected for its, its um, uh, likelihood to, to pass a measure, but which would not be passed in particular counties or cities. Essentially, um, his concern is that it does not keep the local control local enough. Um, personally, I, I think there's, there's some force to that argument, but on the other hand, um, we are moving into a world where we are going to have to act at a more regional level. We all know it is happening. Um, I would, uh, so I, I continue to support it and hope that you all would support it as well. Uh, but I did want to be sure that uh, Council Member Barnes' concerns were, were voiced in his absence. Do you need a motion? We need a motion. I'm not going to make the motion because I'm opposed to it. But uh, Oh, okay. Okay, I'll make that motion because I do support this. Yeah, um, it, it says provide direction to staff on whether to submit the letter to the California State Assembly. Mm -hmm. uh, well, we, let's we, do it as a motion. We could vote. I'll, we, I'll move that we that we do send the letter. And I'll second. Councilmember Moss. Yes. Councilmember Pelch. Yes. Vice Mayor McQuaid. No. Mayor Nason. Yes. And I'm perfectly happy to send it. I just think they're going down the wrong path. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Understood. All right, we have um, other business, announcement of events and future agenda items, uh, which include, well, you, you read these, don't you? No, we, we just, uh, uh, they're just here on the, please check the, the website for, uh, for upcoming events. The one event I would really like to mention is the S San Pablo Avenue Corridor Redesign Public Workshop mm. on Thursday, April 4th at 6 p.m. here in the City Hall Council Chambers. Um, that is a, uh, a very important uh, project and very important for um, Albany uh, people to have their, their voices heard, and I hope you will come. The rest are pretty much standard items, uh, various commissions, we, and we have the next city council meeting on April 15th at 7.30 here in the chambers. I think I have something to say. Pardon? I think okay, okay, yes. So, um, first of all, a question. Civics Academy, what time of year is that usually? Has it been in the spring? It's spring. usually right now. It was supposed to start on March 20. This is the one we canceled, right? Because we didn't have the signups or? Yeah, it's, it's usually due to lack of signups. Yeah. Um, yeah. Okay, curious. Um, so I want to note that um, we're uh, a bit out of um, compliance with our rules and regulations. We have not yet heard from the bulb subcommittee, and that's supposed to happen. Those subcommittee reports are supposed to be quarterly. Um, also, I had requested agendizing the appointment of the last charter review committee member, um, and I'm concerned that we that has not been agendized. Um, from my reading uh, of the item that you can read in the last um, that, that mayor posted in the last agenda, uh, council members uh, should have their item taken up if requested. 
uh, taken up by the mayor and put on the agenda if requested, and yeah, that has and, not been done. And that was the one that was waiting for the uh, closed session that unfortunately we began today but did not finish. I think we will need to try to continue it uh, on April 15th and, and coming and out uh, of that meeting will know. There's no provision in the rules and regulations for waiting and you've, you've told us of your reasons for waiting. I don't understand them, I don't agree with them and uh, I ask that you agendize this. On the next agenda, I, I'm, I'm a little concerned that um, our rules and regulations are not being followed. I, I would have to agree with Council Member Pilch. I'd like to see that get on the agenda. Okay, if I haven't, uh, if I haven't appointed someone, um, I just then I will put it on the the next agenda. The the only thing I want to say is I think it's kind of abusive of our volunteers to ask them to sign up for a committee and tell them, we don't know if you're ever gonna have a meeting. Um, this was a really, I think that our procedure on this was a serious mistake. Uh, but uh, I will apologize in advance to my appointee rather than uh, <laughs> refraining from abusing volunteers. And thank them for the, their service and tell them what a wonderful opportunity they have. And how fortunate they are not to have to do any service. They can be on a committee and never have to attend. Um, we adjourn to. tonight in memory of Tom Kroll. Tom Kroll was an Albany, uh, uh, lifelong Albany uh, person. He attended Albany schools throughout his education. He was an active community volunteer. And above all, he was just a really beloved individual. People who knew Tom uh, speak of him with tremendous affection and fondness. He was uh, known for his, his kindness and gentleness, and that's a great thing to be known for. So let's take just a moment to remember Tom. And we are adjourned. <laughs>